so um, dear all, I just want to give you a warm welcome to the conference. Before us are three exciting days and uh, we are very happy to have you here. Uh, now to cut, uh, to cut it short, uh, I'll uh, give the introductory words to Professor Luca Illiterati. Luca, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, and welcome. I'm very happy uh, to open the work uh, of this conference dedicated to the confrontation between Hegel and Spinoza. Uh, the conference uh, is part of the activities of the Internationales Netzwerk Hegel's Relevanz, which brings together a number of research centers working on Hegel's philosophy active in Europe. More specifically, the conference arises from a now well-established collaboration between the Speculative Thought Research Group at the University of Ljubljana and the Hegel PD Research Group on Classical German Philosophy at the University of Padua. The collaboration between these two research groups has been active for some years and I believe it will grow further in the years to come. The title of this conference between substance and subject, the presence of Spinoza in Hegel, evidently refers to the famous proposition in the Forede to the Phenomenology of Spirit where Hegel writes, Es kommt nach meiner Einsicht, welche sich durch die Darstellung des Systems selbst rechtfertigen muss, alles darauf an, das war er nicht als Substanz, sondern, sondern ebenso sehr als Subjekt aufzufassen und auszudrücken. This proposition constitutes perhaps the most explicit and radical programmatic manifesto of Hegel's philosophy. And on the other hand, it highlights how the deepest core of Gillian philosophy, that is the thought of a substance that is also subject and of a subject that is not the other from substance, but rather the vital and active element of substance itself, develops within an ongoing confrontation sometimes explicit and sometimes implicit, but never resolved once and for all with Spinoza's philosophy. Hegel's relationship with Spinoza is one that is never peaceful, always fraught with tensions that evidently refer to, for Hegel to problems and tension involving his own philosophical enterprise. In this sense, I think the section devoted to Spinoza within the Hegelian lectures on the history of philosophy is very emblematic. In it, it is evident how Hegel's judgment towards Spinoza is always ambivalent. Towards Spinoza philosophy, Hegel shows a clear admiration and then at the same time the praise, the explication of the absolute value of Spinozian philosophy also always contains the highlighting of a criticism of an element of problem problematicity of it. To be Spinozian says Hegel in the lectures, is the essential beginning of philosophy. The negation it embodies of all that is particular, and thus the negation of opinion of the merely finite point of view is indeed the absolute basis of philosophy, Hegel says in opening his discussion of Spinozian thought. Even more, this act that Spinozian philosophy embodies, the negation of the particular, of the claims of the particular point of view, as well as the awareness that follows from this act, is for Hegel the act that produces an actual liberation 
of the spirit from the finiteness and exteriority in which it is immersed. Only at the moment one acquires this awareness, Hegel says, that is only at the moment when the finite removes itself from itself can one truly philosophize. Philosophieren ist Spinozieren, according to the motto knowing, known to all. This absolute acknowledgement, however, also contains Hegel's most radical critique of Spinozism, namely that the Spinozian idea of substance, while on the one hand it is the dissolution of the dualisms that grip modern thought, that is, it is the understanding of being as a unity of opposites, which unlike Plato's naive universe, universal is known by means of the absolute opposition of concept and being, is on the other hand a unity that is, according to Hegel, only abstract, that is not determined as in, as in itself concrete. The overcoming of particularity which constitutes Spinoza's great achievement that which makes Spinozism the absolute basis of philosophizing is thus for Hegel at the same time its limitation, since it is what makes Spinoza's substance an abstract substance. It is a substance that excludes from itself the particular, the dimension of concrete individuality. Moreover, the overcoming of dualism that so powerfully characterizes Spinozian thought could, according to Hegel, be a reflection of Spinoza's, Spinoza's being Jewish. Spinoza war ein Jude, says Hegel in the 80, 23, 24 lectures on the history of philosophy as transcribed by Otho. Und seine Philosophie ist ein Nachklang des Morgenlandes. Die morgenländische Anschauung der absoluten Identität ist durch in der europäischen Philosophie der allgemeinen Weise des Denkens unmittelbar näher gebracht, in sie eingeführt. In this sense, if Judaism is what enables Spinoza to overcome dualism, on the other hand, it is also what would prevent him from grasping the fundamental principle of Christianity, and therefore, according to Hegel, the fundamental principle of the modern age, namely the principle of subjectivity, the idea that, the idea that this unity of soul and body of thought and being is not some, something simply given, is not something that simply exists, but is realized through the action of subjectivity which alone makes that unity itself concrete. The reading that Hegel proposes is by no means linear and simple. If in fact Christianity and the principle of which Christianity is the bearer, that is the principle of subjectivity, is what must realize that unity that Spinoza claims, on the other hand, Christianity and the principle of subjectivity that characterizes it is also at the origin of that dualism, dualism of which Spinoza's philosophy is the overcoming. In this sense, Spinoza's position in the Hegelian reading of the history of philosophy is from a certain point of view a paradoxical position. For on the one hand, Spinoza constitutes a kind of way out of the pathologies of the modernity, and on the other hand, the Spinozian way out is a way out, according to Hegel, unsatisfactory, precisely because it is not modern. A similar tension emerges from the way Hegel treats the Spinozian causa sui. Indeed, the concept of causa sui is a, of fundamental import importance to Hegel. For the causa sui is that cause which, while it operates and separates another, likewise produces itself, and in this activity removes all difference. <coughs> 
In the lectures, Hegel notes that this concept, the concept of causa sui, is a truly speculative concept. Actually, the fundamental concept of all speculation. Indeed, the concept of causa sui seems to refer to that self-movement of the concept that is produced through the differentiation of self from self that constitutes the defining element of the Hegelian conception of thought as subjectivity. That is, in a certain way, the concept of causa sui seems to contain within itself that dimension of subjectivity that Hegel believes is missing from the Spinozian substance, so much so that Hegel states that, I quote, if Spinoza had carried out more particularly what is contained in the causa sui, his substance would not be the rigid. And of quotation. On the other hand, it is clear that the concept of causa sui is the pivotal concept of the Spinozian idea of substance, and one would therefore be prompted to ask, is Spinoza, who did not develop the concept of causa sui, or is it Hegel who needs to see in the Spinozian substance something rigid in order to bring out by difference the need to think the subjectivity that constitutes it. Those I have mentioned are just a few examples which testifies to the extraordinary problematic nature that runs through Hegel's confrontation with Spinoza's philosophy, which will find articulation in the various contribution that we will have the opportunity to discuss during these days. Contribution that will be offered by some invited speakers that we have chosen from among the most influential scholars of the Hegel-Spinoza relationship and some who were selected through a call. We received an impressive number of proposals and we could not accept all of them within the conference, even though the level of the proposal was almost always very high. We were very sorry that we could not have accepted more of them, of them than we actually did, but as you can understand, it was really not possible to do otherwise. Before we begin the actual work, let me address special thanks uh, first of all, to Professor Zdravko Kobe, who conceived this conference, but to the whole group that worked in the concrete organization of these days, and as Giovanna Luciano of the University of Padua, Martin Ergut, Bojana Jovicevic, and Goran Vranesevic of the University of Ljubljana. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Christian Kreinen, and I have the honor to tell you something about the international network about Hegel's relevance, which uh, Professor Luca Illiterati already mentioned shortly in his um, introduction. But first, let me thank the organizers, Strout Kokoba and uh, Luca Illiterati, including their whole team of, uh, of helpers for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, and impressive um, um, conference here in Ljubljana. So, uh, the network, what is the network about? Uh, around 2015, <coughs> Professor Klaus Frieweg and I had the idea that it would be important to uh, set up a platform where people who are systematically interested in Hegel could meet on a regular basis and discuss current issues, uh, current issues in particular regarding the relevance of Hegel's philosophy for contemporary philosophy. <clears throat> we started out with the idea, let's meet once a year on a conference, but uh, it turned out that there was so much interest 
that uh, soon we started having two conferences a year. Uh, of course, until um, uh, Corona then popped up and, uh, so to say, destroyed our uh, initial plans and uh, um, made us to, uh, to reorganize the whole issue and afterwards continuing again with conferences uh, once uh, and then also twice a year. Well, uh, regarding the, the issues, the topics, there are no limits at all. The, the, whole, the basic idea is that we do something which is of interest uh, for uh, assessing uh, Hegel's uh, systematic relevance in philosophy, and we do that in a way, or we intend to do it in a way that uh, what is presented is, is also congenial with the method of speculative idealism itself. So in that sense, we do normally not very much on uh, philological analysis or merely historical analysis. It's always about the matter at stake. And we are also, or most uh, contributors are convinced that uh, dealing with Hegel does not imply that ne Hegel needs to be translated in other programs of philosophy, for example, analytical philosophy of language to uh, talk about Hegel's relevance. So that's how to say the, the basic idea. Then 2015, we started with this. The first meeting we had, the first conference, the constituting conference was 2017 in Amsterdam um, uh, about concepts of normativity, Kant or Hegel. Uh, then 2018 in Prague, an ethical modernity, Hegel's concept of ethical life today, its limits and potential. Then 2019 in Jena, Logik und Moderne, Hegel's Wissenschaft der Logik als Paradigma moderner Subjektivität. Yeah, and then, uh, as indicated, we had this issue with Corona. Uh, several um, meetings had to be postponed. One was even completely cancelled, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, namely a meeting uh, that should have taken place in, um, in Linz. Uh, Warum Religion heute? Zur Aktualität von Hegel's Religionsphilosophie. But there will be uh, a volume uh, that collects the intended um, uh, contribution to the uh, meeting. And then <coughs> um, uh, one of the conferences was then even rescheduled for this spring uh, in uh, Pisa about Hegel's aesthetic. Uh, sense is this wonderful word, Hegel and the aesthetic. And um, uh, one, year, one spring earlier, 2022, we had in Heidelberg uh, a conference on Hegel's philosophy of reality. Uh, presently, also um, other conferences, future conferences, are um, in the phase of preparation. Next May, we will meet in Coimbra discussing Hegel's philosophy of nature and the environment, so the whole uh, problem of the climate we are con uh, contemporarily faced with. Uh, then um, in, uh, in Paris there will be a meeting, uh, another meeting is planned in Italy. Uh, we even are considering to organize a meeting um, um, on, um, yeah, what's the English word for this? Gedenkveranstaltung. Uh, so uh, kind of meeting to memorize the importance of Hans Friedrich Fulda, who uh, died unfortunately some weeks ago in Germany. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, maybe for your information, uh, the contributions of the, of the conferences are published uh, in, uh, in a series, Critical Studies in German Idealism, at the publishing house Brill. So there you can read then uh, um, about the results. And uh, yeah, if somebody would like to join the, uh, the network in the sense of contributing by organizing a uh, conference him or herself, then please do not hesitate and contact me or contact Klaus Fiebeck and uh, we can discuss the possibilities uh, in this respect. So with this I wish all of us a very inspiring uh, meeting and uh, inspiring both in uh, with regard to the matter at issue but also maybe in your personal meetings or uh, encounters with the other um, participants. So thank you. As a first speaker of the conference, I have the honor to 
introduce Professor Miriam Binnenstock, a very brief presentation. Miriam Binnenstock is Emeritus Professor at the University of Tours. Uh, she dedicated her research to the practical philosophy of German idealism, more particularly Hegel, and to the Jewish thought of 19th and 20th centuries, publishing mainly on Hermann Cohen, Franz Rosenzweig, and Emmanuel Levinas. Um, the title of her today's talk is Transcendental versus Aesthetical Pantheism, Hegel's Way Towards Spinozism. Uh, Professor Binnerstock, you have, <coughs> you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Goran Brandevich, Bravo Professor Kobe, and Luca Di Luterati for this invitation, which does not just allow me to take a first look at this beautiful city of Ljubljana, but which also honors me. I take the liberty of presenting a highly classical introduction. It may be outdated or not fashionable. Actually, I call it a vintage presentation of the pantheism and Hegel on the pantheism, but I do hope that it will nevertheless be useful. I have already worked a lot on the subject of this conference, and like many of the colleagues who are here today, but I think that what has been done is far from exhausting the many questions that remain open and I shall try to focus upon some of them. There were in Hegel's times many different ways or routes towards Spinoza, as I have called them in a recent article on the subject. Three of them are particularly relevant to discuss Hegel's own route towards Spinoza. The first one is Mendelssohn's, the root of the German Enlightenment, the Aufklärung. We know that Hegel took stand for Spinoza after having read Jacobi's letters. But in these letters, Spinoza was represented by Lessing and by Mendelssohn, an author whom Hegel has read and studied very early on. Surprisingly enough, though, yeah, thank you, an adequate investigation of Hegel's attitude to Mendelssohn remains, up to this day, a real desideratum of research. That which is at stake in Hegel's reading of Mendelssohn, before and then after he had read Jacobi's letters on Spinoza, is not just his attitude on Spinoza, but also the important and related question of his stand on the Aufklärung, the German Enlightenment, that is, on the basic question of religious tolerance. On the Aufklärung, Jacobi's own position had been unambiguously clear, although not unambiguous on Spinoza himself. But it had not been Spinoza whom Jacobi had targeted Spinoza had long been dead, and Jacobi targeted living adversaries. Amongst them, first and foremost, the main representative of the Berlin Aufklärung, Moses Mendelssohn. This had been so obvious that many, already at the time, judged that Jacobi had killed Mendelssohn, perhaps not personally and literally, but in any case, figuratively. From this it was inferred that his publication marked the twilight, perhaps even the end of the Enlightenment as such. The claim has survived up to the present day. Many indeed do say that the philosophy of the Enlightenment is not alive anymore today. I'm not convinced. Let me take the liberty of expressing the hope that the philosophy of the Enlightenment is still alive in many forms. But it is up to you and many others to say if this hope is outdated or not. It is, in any case, undeniable 
that the success of Jacobi's publication was momentous. It was so great that it did stall the momentum towards the Enlightenment as a whole. Coming back to the reception of Mendelssohn, that main representative of the German Enlightenment, it would certainly not be exaggerated to say, and this is another point I would like to make here, that Mendelssohn, who prior to 1785 had been considered as one of the greatest living German philosophers, began to be perceived after the publication of Jacobi's letters, mainly as a Jew, who had understood neither Spinoza nor his friend Lessing. One seems to have wholly forgotten that it was Mendelssohn who had served as a living model for Nathan in Lessing's piece on behalf of religious tolerance, Nathan der Weise, so that it was nothing, nothing less than the fight for religious tolerance, that essential impulse of the Enlightenment in Germany and in also in other countries, which thereby collapsed. Amongst the many perspicuous remarks Jacobi makes in his letters, there is one which he actually puts in Mendelssohn's mouth and which I find very relevant to our queries, according to which Mendelssohn, when he heard for the first time that Lessing had held Spinoza's system to be true, asked which system of Spinoza it was, which was meant. The one expounded in the Tractatus that of the Principia Philosophia Cartesiana, or the one which was presented posthumously in the ethics. It is quite amazing, I think, to discover that there is, again, almost a research gap on Hegel's reception of Spinoza's Tractatus. But I do not want to be too provocative, and I shall be somehow more prudent. I'm not saying that nothing has been done on that topic, but only that very little has been achieved. And this is even truer when one compared the number of studies devoted to that question, the question of Hegel's reception of the Tractatus, which ought to have been a central one for Hegel scholars, to the number of studies of pantheism, on pantheism. Still, I have already written and published on these questions and I shall not focus upon them here, also because Giacomo Petrarca, who will speak directly after me, seems to want to address that. I leave that to him with great pleasure and expectation. Which system of Spinoza is it then, which we mean when we meditate over Hegel and his reception of Spinoza? Those who take account of the Principia also want to discuss Spinoza's relation to Descartes, but we mostly assume that it is the system presented in the ethics which is meant. The root which is most popular up to this day is the Promethean transcendental one endorsed by Fichte and many authors linked to the German ide early Romanticism. And maybe it is no accident that this conference also hints at it by choosing as a title substance and subject. This, however, could well be the very root which was criticized by Herder under the appellation transcendental Spinozism. Since 1787, the year in which these conversations were first published, Herder writes in the preface to the second edition of his God, Some Conversations, and I quote, a great deal has changed on the philosophical horizon in Germany. Spinoza's name, which before that time was usually mentioned with horror and loathing, thereafter rose so high in the estimation of some that they could not speak of him save at the expense of Leibniz and of other excellent spirits. Indeed, his system was so misused that, 
forgetting all the limits of human knowledge, which Spinoza recognized so well, some turned things upside down and made bold to spin out the contents of the entire universe from a confined and imaginary ego. This senseless dream was called transcendental Spinozism, and the old Spinoza was derided because he had not gone so far. Things have not changed much since that time, and it is surprising, for it cannot be doubted that Hilder played a major pioneering role in the reception of Spinoza in Germany. But this is not properly acknowledged up to this day. This is particularly true with regard to Hegel. For Hegel seems to have read Herder very early on and extensively. He even wrote a review of Herder's God in which he detailed the differences between the two editions of the God, but that review seems to have been lost. His way of proceeding in his article of 182 entitled Faith and Knowledge is particularly striking. It is to Jacobi that he devotes the greatest number of pages, many more indeed than to Kant and to Fichte. And what is even more striking is his lack of attention for Herder. He gets rid of him in one page, going as far as writing that Herder's way of doing philosophy is only a slight modification of the philosophizing pattern one finds in Jacobi. He puts Kant, Jacobi, and Herder together, and he vehemently rejects their way of practicing philosophy, that reflexions, philosophy, their subjectivity, he finds in Kant, Jacobi, and also Herder. Isn't that too quick? One may rightly wonder, also with Frau Zandkaulen today, about his relative silence, for he rarely quotes Herder explicitly, also in his later mature writings. The position I shall advocate here is that the kind of transcendental Spinozism deprecated by Herder in his the second edition of his God may account for some forms of early romanticism and for a Hegelian appropriation of Spinoza based upon some of his early texts, but certainly not for his mature appropriation of Spinoza, the one we find in his encyclopedia, which is much closer to that to which I have referred as an aesthetic Spinozism. This is only a provisory denomination though, but for the question then is, of course, to understand what one means by aesthetics, and I understand now that there will be another tagum on the, precisely of that subject. I will first have to get hold of the old edition of Herder's God, Hegel writes in a letter dated 26 August 1801, so that I can give account of the new edition. It is at least clear to me that he left out what Jacobi discusses in the letters. Had he truly grasped this, he would have had to leave everything out. What is it then? that Jacobi discussed in his letters. What was that question which had been left out by Herder? The fact that at the same time in 1802, Hegel ascribed much importance to characterizing the concept of Kraft or force, a concept he believed to have been fundamental for Herder, led many to suppose that this must have been the point mistakenly left aside by Herder. It is true, Hegel writes, that Herder does not go as far as replacing rational thought with feeling or with the subjectivity of an instinct as Jacobi would do. He rather replaces it with the notion that he sees as the center of the Spinozist system that of force or original force or craft. In this sense, his way of philosophizing would be a little more objective than Jacobi's. But, Hegel adds, the concept of craft is merely a concept of reflection, something in which the rational is also veiled, and which Herder has no intention any more than Jacobi had 
of unveiling and hüllen for philosophical knowledge. For reason, Herder would also explicitly claim that he has no intention of explaining what he meant by uh, force. Herder, Hegel writes in Faith and Knowledge, and Hegel quotes him at length, his fully account, Herder is fully account, conscious of what he's doing when he expounds the central thesis of the spinozistic system with the, uh, the first organic force, one signifies at the same time the inner and outer, the spiritual and the corporeal, but it is still only an expression, for we do not understand what force is, nor do we claim to have explained the word body by it. This is exactly Jacobi's concern, to replace philosophical ideas with expressions and words which are not supposed to give knowledge or understanding. These words and expressions may well have a philosophical meaning, but Jacobi's polemic is directed precisely against the philosophies which take them seriously and make their philosophical meaning articulate. Those commentators who want to account for Hegel's criticism of Herder by singling out his criticism of the concept of craft also refer to the importance Hegel ascribed to that notion until the end of his life and to what he says in his 1830 Encyclopedia's Logic. He says there that construing God as force is, a quote, I quote, a confusion from which Herder's God suffers especially. And what he then valorizes is the difference between the notion of force, craft, and that of purpose or zweck. But at Jena, and more particularly in Faith and Knowledge, Hegel did not yet resort to the notion of Zweck, or more generally to teleology. His positive appreciation of Spinozism rather led him to carefully avoid such an approach. This means that he cannot possibly have wanted in those years to criticize Herder for not having resorted to the concept of Zweck and for not having grasped the difference between Zweck and Kraft. The reproach he formulates against Herder is a much more fundamental one. He writes that both our authors, namely Jacobi and Herder, Herder, share the effort to abolish the scientific form of rational cognition wherever it is present. Herder would have abandoned from the start any and every attempt to grasp what a force is and thereby rallied Jacobi, Jacobi's vindication of faith. Hegel brings Herder back to Jacobi. And it is first and foremost Jacobi's philosophizing practice that he unilaterally rejects that cannot be doubted. However, his starting point in reading Herder in ja is Jacobi's viewpoint, Jacobi's perspective in the letters, a perspective that he himself condemns. He condemns Her Herder because he assimilates his viewpoint to Jacobi, to Jacobi's, which he condemns. But is it right to assimilate Herder's position to Jacobi's. For Hegel, in any case at that time, it is clearly Jacobi who determines what is at stake in the debate on Spinozism. It is Jacobi who formulates the questions that contemporaries must answer in philosophy. And Hegel seems to believe, in any case at that time, that if Herder does not answer these questions of Jacobi, he has nothing more to say. For if we are to believe Hegel in faith and knowledge, Herder did accept Jacobi's opposition between knowledge and faith. He would have recognized that science, or to say this more properly, philosophical science, must be abandoned in favor of faith, Glaube. The conclusion then being that we must take the perilous leap, the salto mortale, into faith. 
This was Jacobi's famous formulation in his letters. But Hegel does not only forcefully reject the conclusion, the need of a perilous leap, but also its presuppositions, the opposition between knowledge and faith. For him in 1801-1802, that is precisely at the time when he is elaborating his system of philosophy, what is essential is to elaborate the scientific form in which rational knowledge must be presented. And there can be no question of renouncing it in favor of faith. And if there is no question of that, this is because renouncing knowledge, rational knowledge, also means, obviously, renouncing freedom, and with freedom, all morality. Hadden Spinoza's aim being to set himself free through knowledge, Hilda would renounce this aim and this thus lose the essence of the Spinozist system. This is what, why Hegel claims that had he truly grasped this, he would have had to leave everything out. What Hegel is looking for in Hilda then is an answer to questions that were Jacobi's questions but perhaps not those of Herder himself. And it is because he does not find a satisfactory answer to these questions of Jacobi in Herder's writings that he rejects Herder out of hand without acknowledging that in many other respects he is still Herder's disciple. Perhaps this is why he finds it difficult to recognize what he really owes in Herder, owes to Herder. Perhaps this is also why even today it is difficult for us to recognize the debt he owes to Herder. We also read uh, Herder quite often whilst having in mind other authors, Jacobi's letters and of course Kant's ferocious criticism. For us to understand and correctly appreciate Hegel's judgment of Herder in faith and knowledge, we must, however, keep in mind the huge difference between Herder's appreciation of Spinoza and Jacobi's. Herder, this should be strongly emphasized, never accepted, he most probably never really understood, the opposition Jacobi had introduced between faith and knowledge and the necessity to perform a leap into that which was called by Jacobi Glaube, faith. If it is not necessary to perform a salto mortale, why does one need to perform it? Wenn man keinen salto mortale zu tun nötig hat, warum braucht man ihn zu, zu tun? And surely we may, that is, need not do that, because in the creation we are on level ground. Und gewiss that's my translation, it's a bit difficult. Wir dürfen es, das heißt, brauchen es nicht. Denn wir sind in der Schöpfung auf ebenem Boden. This is what Herder writes to Jacobi in a letter dated February 6, 1784, which is of paramount importance for understanding the pantheism controversy and Hegel's reaction to it. Here is one of the key passages. The proton pseudos error in premise in your system and that of all the anti-Spinozists, dear Jacobi, is that God, as the great antium, who is in all phenomena the eternally acting cause of its being, would be a zero, an abstract concept like the one we formulate for us. But this is not what it is, according to Spinoza. It, God, rather is the most real, most active one, the one, only one saying to itself, I am that I am and shall be that I shall be. It is not from the negation of the proposition ex nihil or nihil fit, but from the eternal proposition, quid quid est, illud est, whatever is, it is, 
that the philosophy of the true entity begins. It is precisely that concept of being which Spinoza developed in such a fertile way, and it is rightfully, in my opinion, that he put it above all the modes of representation and thinking of singular phenomena, as well as above limited modes of existence in space. What Herder says here is that Jacobi's conception of Spinoza is an utterly reactive one, one which reacts to Spinoza's most basic affirmation, the affirmation of God's being, by negating it. The main reason for which it misrepresents or distorts Spinoza's thought is that it does not begin with being as such, with the concept of sein, but with abstract concepts, concepts we are the ones to concoct. It begins with the knowing subject. What we should learn from Spinoza is that one must set at the center of our philosophical reflection the concept of sein, being or Dasein, existence, not the knowing subject and his representation, ish or the ego. And Hegel repeats this, Hilder, excuse me, will repeat this in his God at the beginning of the fourth conversation in which he discusses Jacobi. Spinoza, he says, there adopts being, sein, also Dasein, and not the I or consciousness as his points of point of departure. This will also be Hegel's point of departure in the science of logic of the encyclopedia. It is important to realize that Herder's interest in Spinoza predated Jacobi's. Herder seems to have studied the ethics, parts two and four, during the years 71, 76, and at the same time, with much attention, the Tractatus. But he had led the foundations of his conception long before he read Spinoza, and long before the years of the pantheism controversy, perhaps already in 1762, 1764, as he was following Kant's lectures in Königsberg. Listening to these lectures certainly was one of the most powerful experiences in Herder's life. But if we want to correctly understand their impact on him, we must keep in mind that Kant in those years had not yet performed that which is known as his critical turn. He was preparing works like the attempt to introduce the concept of negative magnitudes into philosophy or the only possible argument in support of a demonstration of the existence of God. Equals of these works may be found in writings of Herder, which were composed in those years more particularly in a fascinating fragment on being, dated 1764. The fragment was published for the first time in 1936, but the great historian of philosophy, Wilhelm Giltai, whom we all know here, if only because of his works on Hegel, had already given a commentary of it in 1894 without, however, having read and known the text itself. He seems to have relied upon a commentary offered by another 19th century Hegel specialist, Rudolf Heim, in his work on Herder. Diltai's commentary then became nevertheless a landmark, not just for the scholarship on Herder, but also for the Hegel scholarship. Diltai, who thereby also relied upon Rudolf Heim's commentary, had written that when Herder listened to Kant's teaching in 1762-1764, when he heard that the philosoph philosophical analysis is ultimately confronted with concepts that are unanalyzable, unanalysierbar, like those of Dasein, existence, space and time, but also Kraft, force, he felt much strengthened in an aesthetical approach or perspective to the universe. 
But when we today look at Herder's text itself, we reach the conclusion that Herder learn, learned from Kant or believed he could learn many other lessons. Kant in 1762-1764 did not yet reject the endeavor to demonstrate the existence of God. He rather set out to determine the true foundations such a demonstration might have. And to this end, he criticized some of its more traditional formulations, including Descartes' ontologi ontological proof. He distinguished between different meanings different uses the term Dasein or, or the term Sein could have, more particularly between existence as the absolute positing of a thing and existence as a predicate, merely as the relation respect to logicus of something as a characteristic mark of a thing, the copula in a judgment. And this is exactly the distinction that Herder takes over in his fragment of, of being. He then distinguishes between being as a concept, sein as ein Begriff, that is, he says, ein real sein, a real being, and sein as glied eines Satzes, being as a component of a proposition. There are many philosophers, he writes, who do not distinguish between these senses. They want to infer the one from the other to infer from the ideal being to the existential being. This would be what Descartes had done with his, I think, therefore I am, and Crucius with his, I'm conscious of myself, therefore I am. However, both are wrong. They are idealists, Herder says in the same fragment of being. Also, egoisten, egoisten in the literal sense of the term. And this is how Herder resorts to it. These egoists almost consider themselves as gods. Göttlich zu sich sagen kann, ich denke durch mich und alles andere durch mich. Perhaps alone can I say to itself, can say to itself in a divine manner, I, I think by way of myself and all else by way of myself, as if the world could be reconstructed without any a priori premise. Those whom Herder criticizes here are the philosophers, more precisely idealistic philosophers. Contrarily to what Diltai had believed, he does not conclude that being as a concept is just like other concepts, like that of craft or those of space and time, a limit to our knowledge, an obscure and undemonstrable basis to it, and that philosophy itself thus has its limits. He does emphasize that the abstraction, the analysis, or the decomposition the gliderum of our representations cannot expand infinitely. All my representations are sensory, are obscure. Alle meine Vorstellungen sind sinnlich, sind dunkel, he says. Sinnlich und dunkel schon längst als gleichbedeutende Ausdrücke bewiesen. Sensory and unalyzable are synonyms. Thus, the more sensory a concept, the more unanalyzable. And if there is one concept that is the most sensory, it will not be possible to analyze anything within it. This is the case with the concept of being, this little world, which is at the basis of all the others. Philosophers, Hegel writes, Herder, Herder writes, will say that this little world this concept also is completely uncertain. But, aber sind nicht die sinnlichen Begriffe gewiss? But are the sensory concepts not certain? They are more certain than are all the others. But the certainty is objective, not subjective, as in the case of the philosophers, those idealists or egoists. What Herder takes over here is not only Kant's teaching at the time, but also that of Baumgarten. 
the author whose manuals Kant regularly followed in those years. The central issue for him is not to show that Zinlich sensory means unanalyzable, inscrutable rationally. He rather wants to show, on the contrary, that it is the sensory which must be raised to a science, to a specific form of knowledge. And I'm, not, I'm going to skip that. The concept of being, he says, there is the center of all certainty since on the one hand every sensory something and on the other hand every rational something is subordinate to it. For one, the highest degree of proof, quid est, illud est, borders on this concept. Thus being is unanalyzable, unprovable, the center of all certainty. Hegel does not conclude here. Herder, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, it's not yet. Herder, almost, but not yet. Herder does not conclude here any more than Kant had done at the same time that it is impossible to demonstrate the existence of God. It would be more accurate to formulate what he says differently. He contends that such a demonstration is unnecessary, that it is superfluous. This is also what he will say much later on in his God, and I quote, the idea of God is essential to our thinking, so essential indeed that without it, without the conception of God, there would be no reason, much less a demonstration. For even if one does not take into consideration the source of the forces which think, act, and work, the tremendous number of which the transcendental philosopher, that is, one who overreaches himself, can never deny to be present in our world, yet the manner alone in which all these works, these forces work according to their nature, is for me proof enough of God, that is, of an essential ground of inner truth, harmony, goodness, and perfection, which includes its existence in itself. The fact that there is, for example, a truth that is something capable of being thought, and that what can be thought can be related according to inner laws, and that by means of innumerable relations of this kind, harmony and order are revealed, is to me in itself the profoundest proof of God. Even were I an unhappy egoist or idealist who imagined himself to be the only thinking being in the world. Between every subject and predicate, there stands an is or is not. And this is, this formula of equation and coincidence between different ideas, the mere sign equal is my proof of God. This is what Herder says in his God, a work whose first edition appeared in 1787, the second in 1800, and which may rightly count at the first book length explicitly positive vindication of Spinoza in Germany. At its point of departure, one doesn't find the I or consciousness, but the concept of being, of sein, also Dasein. The concept has been translated into English as existence, and one will not be surprised to hear that Herder has, for that reason, attracted the attention of some Heideggerians. Heideggerians. I'm not so sure that this rapprochement, or even the comparison, will turn out to be fruitly, fruitful, but it is certainly significant that Herder had begun to elaborate his basic ideas on God and on being long before he brought them back to Spinoza. For it only was in the 80s that he seems to have immersed himself in the study of Spinoza's metaphysics. At that time, he also convinced Goethe, whose declaration in a letter dated June 9, 1785, has remained famous. Spinoza, Goethe then wrote, does not demonstrate the existence of God. The existence is God. And if for that reason others schooled him as an atheist, I would like to
to call him theissimum and Christianimum, Christianissimum and to praise him. Now, the road, yes, from this, from this thesis to Hegel is very short. It is to be sure Hölderlin, whom many Hegel scholars most often evoked when they endeavored to reconstruct Hegel's uh, way. They pointed to discussions Hegel had with Hölderlin at the time of his stay in Frankfurt. And I'm alluding here mainly to Dieter Henrich, recently deceased in his Hegel in context. There is no reason to question the importance of the role played here by Hölderlin. It may well be him who was the first to develop the philosophical arguments one find in Hegel. For example, in a fragment Hegel seems to have written in 1795 in Bern, Glauben ist die Art, Union and Being, etc. But I'm not going to quote that now, even if this is fundamental. Hey. It is a uh, uh, Dieter, but Dieter Henrich would never have put in doubt the fact uh, that Hegel's discussions will, with Hölderlin all have in their background Herder's writings, and naturally also the two editions of Herder's God. He himself wrote on that. Still, and this is my conclusion, Herder has a fairly bad reputation amongst philosophers. Maybe, perhaps, mainly because of Kant, who had harshly criticized him for an alleged obscurantism, de l'obscurantisme, one which would be directly opposed to his own endeavor as a philosopher, and in other words, to the German Enlightenment movement, the Aufklärung. Let me come back to my conclusion, in my conclusion to my beginning. Herder is supposed to be a Schwärmer, an enthusiast. That term was used at the time by proponents of the Aufklärung as a libel, synonym of fanatic, in order to fight all those positions which did not seem to them compatible with their own convictions. And then Jacobi took over the term and turned it against his own opponents, Kant included. So where do we stand on the Enlightenment? Not just with Herder and Hegel, also with ourselves. This could be one basic question of this conference. And I thank you for your for this rich and detailed presentation. And now time for questions. So please, there, if ever anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Okay, I see Zanon. <coughs> Thanks a lot for this inspiring talk. Um, until I heard you, I was thinking only that, 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 that Jacobi ha has been the one who started a kind of reaction against reason through the name of the God. But now, <coughs> after your presentation, I have a question, because you mentioned that Herder was the first who, who just accused the philosophers as egoists. And if you think that, that, a, that, a, that a critique of the absence of God in the, in the, uh, in the reason, in the enlightenment, has become a point of reaction, in the whole German uh, tradition. Can we make, make a triangle between like um, Herder, Jacobi, but also Heidegger? Because he, uh, if you think, Heidegger never talked of God as God, but he talked then uh, for criticizing the reason, I mean Hegel's reason, the um, forgetfulness of being. But can, uh, w would you say that there is a kind of connection which, through the name of God, or not articulated name of God, always keeps a kind of uh, critique of reason, which, uh, interestingly, not only has to be reactionary, because if you just think of Adorno, he used the same, like, it becomes a point of resistance against concepts. 
like like this God become uh, remains as 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 a ghost in the concept and and uh, gives a reaction to to be conceptualized. That will be my question. If you if you could see a kind of um, triangle between Herder, Jacobi, and Heidegger. Well, yes, uh, I thought uh, the mention of Heidegger would raise questions <laughs> or, or, or interest, but uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist of uh, Heidegger, actually, uh, so I'm, I'm not so sure. It's, uh, uh, and, and I'm not so sure that the relation is that uh, fruitful as, as a reaction to, to, to understand a, a, a reaction to, to a, a, actually a, a, a kind of, of, of subjective idealism, if that's uh, what, what it is. There, there was a reaction to a certain kind of subjective idealism in, in, a, uh, in Herder, but uh, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, one can related so so simply uh, and in Hegel actually but I'm not so sure one can relate it to to uh, uh, directly to to Heidegger I'm not so sure I understood your question properly <laughs> yeah okay yes I guess um, by the way um, um, for those who are watching the YouTube stream, you can pose a question, and during the time it will be answered. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. It was e extremely rich and interesting. Just a, a quick point about the point you made at the beginning, uh, saying that there is not so much um, responses to Mendelssohn in Hegel, or at least not so much discussion. I suspect there is one place where Hegel is referring to Mendelssohn, in the context of Spinoza, but not so positively. And if you remember the passage in the lectures on the history of philosophy, where Hegel is uh, referring to the three systems of theology, aquismism, Spinozism, against atheism, and then there is the middle position. The middle position is saying both God exists and finite things exist. I think that's the Mendelssohnian um, Leibniz in position, Hegel thinks it's popular. He criticized that, but I'm not, I, my suspicion is that that's precise. He, th this similar criticism I think he's basically taking from Maimon, but that's the point. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, yeah, question. Uh, I think there is a, uh, uh, Compared, as compared to the, the influence uh, Mendelssohn uh, and the reading of Mendelssohn uh, had uh, on, on Hegel, I think very little uh, has been done, actually. Of course, uh, uh, Hegel says uh, uh, that he, uh, uh, Hegel re re relates to Mendelssohn uh, uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, somehow uh, not as much as uh, yeah, what one would have expected him to, uh, co considering the fact that he seems to have read him a long time before he read Jacobi, actually. Yeah, and, and Spinoza, he, uh, Mendelssohn, was one of the first authors he cultivated and, and uh, read, and uh, yeah, not uh, just uh, uh, the Jerusalem, but also uh, other books. And there were certain uh, authors who said that some of his basic concepts, uh, Hegel's basic concepts, are indebted, actually, to uh, uh, Mendelssohn. That has not been uh, stud properly studied, I think. but. What strikes me most is the fact that Hegel very certainly read 
uh, Mendelssohn's Jerusalem, and that Mendelssohn is one work which is uh, which had been written especially to to to, to further religious tolerance. And Hegel doesn't say that. And Hegel seems not to see that at all. And this is one of the points, I think, which deserve further inquiry. Uh, why doesn't Hegel uh, see that in Mendelssohn? And further on, of course, what is Hegel's position on religious tolerance? So yes, of course, there are. Uh, you just quoted one point, there are certain uh, 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 place, uh, places where, where uh, uh, Hegel quotes Mendelssohn, but I think this doesn't uh, do justice to the influence of Mendelssohn on his thought. Thank you very much for your um, um, talk. I have two points. Um, the second point I will uh, more speak about tomorrow morning in my uh, talk. Um, I think it's a misunderstanding by Herder um, to think that Jacobi has uh, informed about abstract concepts in Spinoza, just the opposite. Jacobi says in a letter to Herder, I have talked about Sein in allem Dasein. That's very, very important, and that's the source also for Hegel. I will uh, talk about this tomorrow. Um, first point, I think it's very, very important to, to leave this old story of Jacobi as the enemy of the Enlightenment. He has a discussion with Berliner Aufklärung, that's right, but uh, he is no enemy of enlightenment in general. We should discuss about enlightenment. What is enlightenment? What is freedom? What is rationality? What is reason? And we have Jacobi on our side. That's very, very important, and I would be very thankful if we leave down this old story of Jacobi as enemy of enlightenment. I can't hear it anymore, I must say. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for those uh, uh, remarks. Uh, about the first one, uh, what was important to me was to emphasize, because I think that it is a very important point that Herder came first in his uh, 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 somehow valorization of, of, of Spinoza. And he was the first to write on Spinoza and, 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 and Jacobi reacted to, I mean, the, the acceptance of Spinoza, which was beginning to be too much for him in Germany. So Jacobi should be seen as a reaction, not as an initial <laughs> not an initial uh, yeah, 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 introduction of, of, of Spinoza in Germany. Spinoza had so much success already, also in Herder, that Jacobi had to react. Now, how do you want to see this reaction? Whether I know that Jacobi was, in, in, in his first writings, was a, somehow also an Aufklärer, and, and he thought he could rally those two Weimar authors, uh, 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 Herder and Goethe, to his cause. He, he thought he would find in them allies. And uh, yeah, so, so, of course, there is much in Jacobi which may lead us to think that he was a friend of the Enlightenment. Well, with regard to Mendelssohn, I'm not so sure that he was so friendly to him ever. And now, of course, the question is how you, you understand uh, the Enlightenment, particularly the German one, 
and, and, and there are so many, many uh, yeah, 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 definitions of that that uh, yeah, it's impossible to get into it now, but there was an antagonism somehow. <laughs> yeah, German one, of Cleon, yeah. And, and poor Mendelssohn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, okay, very, very quick. I love Helga very much. Both of them start with Kant's Beweisgrund in the 60s, both of them. And there we, we get Sein from Kant. From him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, time for some. As our second speaker, uh, allow me to present Giacomo Petrarca. Giacomo is assistant professor in theoretical philosophy at the University Vita Salute San Raffaele of Milan. His research interests range from the problem of law as a philosophical and theological political issue to the relationship between philosophy and Jewish thought. The title of his today's lecture is Thinking er als ein Jude, Hegelian interpretation of Spinoza between monism and monotheism. Giacomo, the floor is yours. Thanks. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizing board. It is a great honor to be here. And it is not easy speaking in a such prestigious context. So I will do my best. Um, at the beginning of the chapter dedicated to Spinoza in his lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel asserts that, I quote, the dualism, the dualism of Cartesian system, Spinoza's, has a Jew altogether set aside. Shortly afterwards, Hegel goes on to explain that, I quote, the oriental theory of absolute identity was brought by Spinoza much more directly into line, firstly, with the current of European thought and then with the European and Cartesian philosophy in which it soon found a place. First and foremost, I would like, I, I would be a compelling endeavor, sorry, first and foremost, it would be a compelling endeavor to investigate the consistency of Hegel reconstruction in which he establishes a strict connection between Eastern thought and Judaism. We will revisit this aspect later, given that it seems to me there is a certain ambiguity. However, at present, I would like to emphasize the philosophical implications of Hegel's remark to Spinoza's Jewishness. The expression as ein Jude is simultaneously intriguing and revealing serving as a telltale sign of a profound pre-understanding that precedes and permeates the Hegelian interpretation of Spinoza. A pre-understanding, I would like to underscore, that is both cultural and conceptual. Hegel's remark is not a superficial observation or a, a minor biographical note it reveals the strategy through which Hegel catches Spinoza into his philosophical framework. In other words, this remark constitutes the hermeneutical and theoretical trap that Hegel lays to the maledictus. Now, let's proceed to unravel how this trap functions. From Hegel's perspective, this opening move implies some relevant consequences. First, the distinction of a supposed 
different Jewish way of thinking, which is by virtue of which Spinoza, as a Jew, could not, could not have thought differently than he did. And second, that thinking as a Jew not only binds Spinoza to an historical and religious destiny, but more significantly, to a philosophical one. I intentionally used the Hegelian term destiny in Schicksal because, as we will soon discover, it becomes a crucial element in young Hegel's interpretation of Judaism. In the meantime, I pose a question. What did Spinoza think as a Jew that Hegel found so inevitable and strategic to his trap? Let me be explicit on this matter. Hegel's pre-understanding regarding his interpretation of Spinoza does not revolve solely around Spinoza's Jewish identity, nor does it focus only on the idea that, as a Jew, Spinoza sets aside Cartesian dualism through an unspecified oriental intuition of absolute identity. The core of this pre-understanding lies in defining the meaning of Jewishness itself, essentially what it means thinking as a Jew. It is Hegel himself who imparts meaning to this element. He shapes the essence of Spinoza's Jewishness defining its meaning. This implies that Hegel constructs the concept of Jewishness to suit his own speculative needs. This strategic move entangles Spinoza within the narrow web of the Hegelian dialectic thought, but at the same time, it implies an unspoken philosophical exigency on Hegel's part. The task of this paper is to unravel the nature of this exigency. So any, anyway, at this moment, my focus is not primarily on highlighting how Hegel deforms Spinoza's philosophy or analyzing the detrimental effects of the Hegelian critics on Spinoza's thought. There are without doubt crucial aspects that I'm sure we will be discussed during this day. My intention is simply to explore an alternative direction. I would like I would like to underline as the meaning of the Hegelian operation is, at first, to undermine the philosophical position of the adversary before conquering it. It is not by chance that Hegel, before confuting some elements of the Spinozian philosophy, empties of consistency his philosophical legitimacy. I understand that this aspect might provoke disagreement for, from some of us as Hegel, as Hegel uses laudatory expressions to describe Spinoza, uh, as Professor Illetterati has already mentioned it, such as Spinoza is made a testing point in modern philosophy and the famous Philosophieren is Spinozieren. However, it is not worthy that even Julius Caesar in the Bello Gallico movingly praised the enemies he had already defeated. Consequently, I would like to delve into the underlying tension that drives Hegel's imperative to neutralize Spinoza. Right from the outset of the Hegel's operation, there is an evident philosophical exigency regarding Spinoza, although this exigency is quickly removed, concealed, and hidden. However, I believe that this exigency constitutes the underlying threat of Hegel's interpretation, at least in the lectures. In other words, Hegel is not truly grappling with Spinoza. On the contrary, the Spinoza he engages with has been effectively domesticated 
especially in its most problematic aspects. Indeed, it is a kind of phantom of Spinoza. My main thesis is that the manner in which Hegel neutralizes Spinoza follows the same theoretical pattern as Hegel's interpretation of Judaism in his early writings. While it is sufficiently clear what Hegel is seeking, that he, that's it, a concrete understanding of the meaning of opposition or the concept of negation, it remains less clear against whom or what Hegel is contending. Essentially, what tension does Judaism introduce according to Hegel, or what kind of incertitude or risk does it represent from Hegel's perspective? The core of the issue doesn't solely revolve around what Hegel cannot comprehend within both Judaism and Spinoza's philosophy. Instead, it pertains to what Hegel cannot fundamentally think within Judaism and by extension, we, he cannot think within Spinoza's philosophy. The proposal I'm presenting is as follows. Hegel's intention is to demonstrate that the fundamental essence inherent in both Judaism and Spinoza is essentially nihilistic. To clarify this somewhat overused term, I would like to provide the following interpretation with, which closely aligns with Hegel's per perspective. After a brief examination of Hegel's early writings, which I can only summarize on this occasion, it becomes evident that according to Hegel, there is no real transition from Judaism to Christianity, as Judaism fails, fails to establish itself as a concrete and substantial entity. Consequently, Judaism does not truly present a real opposition for Hegel, of course. It is not worthy that when Hegel discusses Spinoza's substance, he employs a singular characterization. Specifically, specifically, Hegel remarks a lack of life, spirituality, and activity, along with rigidity, immobility, and petrification. To illustrate this, one can refer to a passage from the well-known text, text 48, also known in its apocryphal version as the spirit of Christianity and, and its destiny. This passage encapsulates the conclusion of the discourse on Judaism and clearly demonstrates the Hegelian purpose. Hegel writes, I jump a little bit, the destiny, that's Shiksal, of the Jewish people is the destiny of Macbeth, who stepped out of nature itself, clung to alien beings, and so in their service had to trample and slay everything wholly in human nature, and had at last to be forsaken by his God, and be dashed to pieces on his fate itself. Zersch Meter. It's the German verb. In this passage, it becomes clear that Hegel's rejection of Judaism is not simply the result of a concrete overcoming through Christianity. Instead, Hegel's approach is, I would argue, more pernicious and insidious. The draw from Hegel's metaphor Judaism crumbles under the weight or the emptiness of its own faith. Essentially, Hegel is not negating Judaism. He is exposing that the inherent inability of Judaism to establish itself. The phrase used by Hegel in his lecture on Spinoza 
all life in itself is utterly destroyed, accurately characterizes this process of self-annihilation. As a result, the Jewish cosmos and the entities within it seem almost like ghosts, as Hegel reiterates in text 48. They are no even something dead and nullity. Yet they are something only insofar as the infinite object makes them something, that is, makes them not something which is, but something made weak, which on its own account as not life, no rights, no love. Kein Leben, kein Recht, keine Liebe. The, the not worthy feature of this passage is its seamless applica applicability to Hegel's description of the relation between modes and substance within the Spinozian cosmos. So, let's return to our starting point, the, the lecture on history of philosophy. The theological political framework is evident and can be traced through a few key passages. First, we have already noted as Hegel emphasizes that Spinoza thinks as a Jew. And we underlined the exigency that Hegel has to inscribe Spinoza into this particular framework. Second, for Hegel, Spinoza's entire exposition of substance runs into a specific defeat. In fact, he explained God is conceived only as substance and as not as spirit, as concrete. I think that it is essentially essential to remark that for Hegel, and this is the point, what allows Spinoza to set aside Cartesian dualism is precisely what prevents his conception of substance from being conceived as spirit. That is the fact that Spinoza thinks has a Jew. In, order, in other words, for Hegel, the inadequate uniqueness of substance is the very factor that negates the possibility of rightly conceiving the substance itself. Or, more precisely, the uniqueness through which Spinoza conceives the substance, according to Hegel, in its monistic sense. Now, I would like to analyze two specific passages from the Hegelian lecture in order to understand the consistence and the background of this monistic comprehension of Spinoza. Hegel uh, writes, uh, the difference between our standpoint and that of the Eliatic, read Spinozian philosophy, is only this, that through the agency of Christianity, concrete individually, is in the modern world present throughout in spirit. And second passage, Spinoza's system is the absolute pantheism and monotheism, monotheism elevated in thought. While the, while the horizon of meaning introduced by Christian revelation remains fundamentally inaccessible to Spinoza, and it could be not otherwise insofar his Jewishness, it is not worthy how Hegel subtly equates Eastern thought, Eleatic monism, and Jewish monotheism. This move is unequivocal and holds significant consequences. Um, it aligns the singularity of Parmenidian being with, with the uniqueness of the Jewish God, establishing an exclusionary and exclusive concept of unity. So the question arises again, why is Hegel driven driven to make this move against Spinoza. Uh, if we take a quick look on the biblical formulation, 
in, would be interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to see how, from the Hebrew formulation of Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, Lo yeye lecha Elohim acherim al panai, you shall have no other gods before my face. One arrived at the formulation, you shall have not other gods besides me. I'm interested in emphasizing how Hegel uses this last meaning, conceiving a strong exclusionary exclusivist notion of Jewish monotheism in order to consider the uniqueness of substance in the first part of the ethics. In fact, this way to assume the notion of uniqueness of God as empty negativity means a deep deformation of the way through which Spinoza thinks, I will say, the monotheistic and not monistic unicity or uniqueness of substance. I refer here, for the sake of convenience, to just one passage. Et, uh, first part of Etica, uh, Proposition uh, um, 14, uh, Preter Deum nulladari neque concipi potes substantia, and the corollarium is interesting. Inc clarissime sequitur, clarissime <laughs> sequitur, Deum esse unicum. Spinoza's text suggests that God is not one alone in a numerical sense nor in an exclusionary way, where this unicity means exclusion, but rather, he says, unicus. What is striking in this passage is that Spinoza encourages us to merge this concept of uniqueness or unicity strictly linked to the concept of infinity, presenting them as absolute affirmation of the existence of some nature. This, uh, this absolute affirmation, so this absolute positivity of God is exactly what Hegel could not think of Spinoza's perspective. Because this God is not, I quote, the three in one. This God could not become absolute affirmation if, for Hegel, he reiterates the negativity of his emptiness, the negativity of his exclusionary unicity. If you remember the, pa the, the passage in the, in the young Hegel in which Pompeius enters in the temple and uh, found only ein leer Raum. This is this kind of emptiness Hegel is thinking. Here, the point of uh, dispute is the very meaning of this, I, I, I think, I guess. The, the point of the dispute is the very meaning of this preter deum, that for Spinoza does not imply negation, as the text explicitly affirms. I dare to articulate the Spinozian syntagma in the following manner. Besides or beyond God, there is not only God, but there is still God. Mind you, we are clearly at the beginning of the problem, not at his conclusion. However, this seems to me to be a significant, significant shift regarding and against the Hegelian perspective. For concluding, the uniqueness of the Spinozian God is first and foremost as infinite substance, a topological or locative notion. It is only the uniqueness of substance that also makes possible the subsistence of other divinities. The uniqueness of substance does not exclude other substances, but rather shows us they are not really other substances, as so far as those are 
not separated by the idolatrous claim to make them autonomous from themselves. On the contrary, they are constitutive moments of the same uniqueness life. Of course, I don't mean to say that Spinoza is the most consistent hire of Jewish monotheism. That would be rhetorical and unnecessary apologetic. I do want to say, however, that in his philosophy lives one of the most interesting and powerful elements, in my opinion, of Jewish monotheism, namely its anti-idolatrous claim, first of all, against the very idolatry of the people towards their own God. I suggest that the appendix of the part one of the ethics could be reread in this perspective. Indeed, the teleological view and the anthropocentric perspective are a kind of idolatry for Spinoza. But clearly, these are only some conclusive suggestions and many open questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giacomo, for this insightful lecture. So, uh, are there questions? Again, for those watching uh, YouTube stream can post questions in the uh, comments and then it will be read afterwards. So we have Luca. Thank you so, Thank you so much, uh, Giacomo. Uh, it was really interesting uh, and uh, I, I wanted to, to have much more um, uh, s something specific about the, 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 the reading uh, of Judaism, uh, I think you can say something interesting to, to us. But I wanted to uh, highlight the possibility of a risk in, uh, in your interpretation. And I think it is a risk, uh, um, uh, I can say so, uh, a nov a risk of an overlapping uh, and uh, a sort of deflagration of uh, uh, Hegel's understanding of Judaism and Hegel's understanding of Spino Spinozian philosophy. Um, I, I think it is uh, important to highlight uh, the presuppositions uh, of uh, uh, Hegel in interpretation of uh, Judaic religion and so on. Uh, it is clear that Hegel's, Hegel's understanding of Spinoza uh, is influenced by his comprehension of Judaism, but I think that if we reduce uh, Hegel's reading of Spinoza in the framework of the interpretation of Judaism, we risk to lose uh, the peculiar ambivalence that uh, um, Spinoza represents for Hegel. Uh, we risk to, uh, to, to give uh, a sort of linear and uh, uh, flat interpretation of, of Spinozism in, in Hegel in this sense. Um, and, and I say this not in the sense of defend Hegel's reading, uh, but uh, in the sense to highlight some elements of unresolved uh, elements in Hegel's reading of Spinoza. Mm. And I think, uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you, the, the main point uh, that is for me problematic is the um, confrontation with the notion of modernity in the sense that for Hegel, modernity uh, is the consequence of the principle of Christianity, of the principle of subjectivity, and so on. But this principle of subjectivity is at the same time at the origin of the um, fragmentation of, of the modernity. And in this sense, I think that Spinoza is the most important of modern philosophers, but it, he is not modern in a certain sense because he has not uh, the principle 
uh, the, the Christian principle of subjectivity. And this is an ambivalence that is very, uh, I think, uh, effective, very uh, interesting uh, in order to analyze the question. I wanted to know uh, what do you think about this question. Thank well, you. Um, thank you very much for this remark that is a, a hidden strong objection. And uh, no, no. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I stressed, of course, the Jewish perspective and the Jewish presence in Hegel interpretation in order to show this, you say, ambivalence. But this, there are two, two, form of this, uh, two forms of this ambivalence. Uh, what the first one is how Hegel shows this ambivalence. And the second one is in which sense this ambivalence is problematic for him. I think this is the problem. And uh, um, the first point is uh, Hegel uh, could not think really Jewish religion, Jewish thought, why? This is the first problem. I, in my opinion, the, the, the strategical, the strategical uh, battle that he, he, uh, he, he moved against Judaism, it's very interesting. There isn't a really, no, he accused Jewish people that uh, don't, don't, doesn't have a, a, a really activity, a really reality. But uh, he doesn't battle against Judaism. He shows the auto, the self, not negation, the self annihilation of the Judaic position. I think it's a very problematic strategy. Why? Because when I, I know, when I say there isn't a, a linear passage from Judaism to Christianity, uh, we, we, we have to ask. So this means that there isn't a linear passage from substance to subject. I know this is the no, this is the hidden question in this paper. But so thank you. <laughs> we have some questions already lined up. So I think first is Professor Melanet, if I saw correctly, and then Professor Holgate, and then Professor Kritchen. Uh Michael Achmal, let's put you now, now too, so that there. Yeah. Microphone, sorry. So, so, I'm sorry if it doesn't <laughs> work. Okay. Now? Okay. Thank you very much. I, it, it was extremely rich and interesting. But so uh, there, there is a clear racial element in Hegel's discussion of Judaism. I, I think it's obvious. Uh, you know, the piling around of all the Easterners together, they are just uh, somewhere there. I mean, a garbage can of Chinese, Jewish, Kulam. I mean, all of that together. I, you know, it's 19th century European racism. We're familiar with that. There is also a very strong element of Christian supersessionism, right? I mean, we, oh, I mean, the New Testament is beyond the, fir the, the, the uh, Old Testament, and we have, there is also an element of absolute ignorance. I mean, when almost absolute ignorance. I mean, Hegel knows very little about Judaism. He knows the Bible, Philo. So uh, trying to speak about Judaism based on that is just like speaking about uh, Confucianism based on the I Ching. You know, something, nothing more than that. But there is something else, and, 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 and that's the attempt to try to essentialize something and try to say there is, some, there is a, something called Judaism, and that's the, th that's the general view. And, you know, I, I find it a lot of times with my colleagues in analytic philosophy asking about Judaism and, and, or whatever. And you know the the simple fact is, it's not clear that there is something like that. 
and and here I I th I would like to perhaps try to complicate some of the points that you were making at the very end of your talk. So yes, there are elements within Judaic and rabbinic tradition that are consistent or supportive of the view that you suggest that uh, God is unique and not in number. So the, the formulations of one and not in number are very common in medieval Jewish philosophy. They are common in the, in the Zohar and other literature. Uh, there are panentheism is extremely common within Brahminian Judaism. I mean, as it happens, I mean, why? But I would try to avoid describing that as an essential Jewish view for many reasons. One of which is because, you know, in Judaism there is, no, I mean, uh, all attempts to create principles of faith were colossal failures, just one after another. So, so my suggestion would be just that when we speak about um, Jewish elements, or Jewish background, I think perhaps we should be a little bit more careful by saying, okay, that's, it, has a, it is an element that has strong presence in Jewish tradition, but I would, stri I would try to avoid the ism at the end, because then it, it, once you get the ism, you are faced the, the fact that you know, it's common, not necessarily by all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very I, I agree uh, with you. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I, I know your, um, your wonderful paper on uh, Spinoza non-monistic essence. And, but I, I think, and uh, I, I, I think I understand the risk to create a label, Judaism, of course. But Hegel needs to do that. So we can, we can say, OK, there is a, a historical background. Uh, it's, the same, it's the same point for uh, Hegelian anti-Judaism. Uh, of course, he's uh, the higher of a tradition, Lutheran and Pauline. And, but the problem is, why does he need to to make this kind of label. Um, and so um, I think this is a, a very controversial point uh, because in, in a certain sense, I, I want not constr to construct a Jewish label. Uh, Rosenzweig, it's a, a, a big testimony for example, on this, on this field. Mm? Judaism isn't a label, you can, there isn't a, okay. And on the other side, every single philosopher or authors who criticize Judaism needs to construct a label. This is my problem. And I think that this problem uh, has, but, uh, Theological political root. This is the original problem of Jewish obstinacy. But this is another, another tale. Thanks. Okay, Professor Holgate. Yes, thank you. Can you am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I guess I also want to ask a question that sort of problematizes your view, um, but it's a little bit difficult to get it exactly precise. Um, in, ask, in asking the question, I'm not trying to defend Hegel's views of Judaism. What I'm interested in is whether his uh, statement that he understands Spinoza as Anyuda is actually consistent with other things that he says about Judaism and about Spinoza. And I'm not sure that it is. In fact, I think a lot of Hegel's understanding of Spinoza is quite inconsistent at times, and interestingly so. So let me give you three ways in which that might be the case. First of all, um, in the lectures, certainly on philosophy of religion, Hegel associates Judaism both with mercy and with judgment. And the judgment, uh, which is very important, Derrida picks up that in his work on, on Hegel and Judaism, separates out the divine and the human in a way that actually Yitzhak was saying earlier is characteristic of Mendelssohn. Um, Hegel does not think that Judaism 
reduces the human to mere shine, but he thinks that Spinoza's substance reduces modes to mere shine. So that doesn't seem very consistent. Um, the second point is Hegel's particular praise for Spinoza's idea of the intellectual love of God. Now you cited there a passage from Hegel where I think he said, no life, no love. Hegel thinks of love as a Christian virtue. Now he may be wrong about that. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that he thinks of it as a Christian virtue and he thinks that Spinoza is the philosopher who understands virtue being rooted in the love of God. So how is that to be squared with the idea that Spinoza is to be thought as Anjuda? It's not consistent. And the last point, which is maybe a little bit obscure, but still, um, again, you cited the idea of uh, Spinoza allegedly being a kind of pantheist. If we look in the aesthetics, and we look under symbolic art, and we look for the art of pantheism, what do we find? We find Persian Islam. We don't find Judaism. Judaism, uh, Hegel focuses on the Psalms, and he sees the Psalms as, a, as an expression of a kind of division between the divine and the human. But Islam is the, po or Persian Islam is the poetry of, or provides the poetry of pantheism. So when we think, when Hegel says that Spinoza, in a sense, is an oriental, has oriental moments, let's not forget that he might also have Islam in mind. So anyway, I just want to suggest that there are more complications there in Hegel's understanding of Spinoza than are captured in the simple idea as Anjuda. And I'm not sure that you really addressed those. Um, just again, you know, Judaism is understood differently from the way he understands Spinoza. There are, seem to be Christian elements in Spinoza as Hegel understands it. And there might, although I agree this is very contentious, <laughs> there might be uh, uh, you know, some parallel between aspects of Persian Islam and Spinoza. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for this impressive remark. Um, I, I, I try to answer shortly. Uh, I, I think that, that um, the image in the representation of Judaism by Hegel in the first period and so in the early uh, writings and in the second part of his uh, production, uh, aesthetics, you say, um, lecture on philosophy of religion, um, is completely different. Uh, in the second part, it's a sort of game of position in which place we have to set Judaism. Uh, Judaism is uh, the first step of a revealed religion or it's the last one of paganism, um, or it's the same for uh, Jewish poetry in aesthetics, in which part we have to put. But in a certain manner, I think that at this moment, Hegel has completely closed his uh, interest, his battle with Judaism. It's, com it's finished. It's a, a sort of label that you can change in a different part of the system. In the first part, it's completely different. You, 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 you quoted uh, love. The problem of love is fundamental. Because Why? Because Abraham, Abraham chose to refuse this love. So the Jewish design is essentially this refused. And this is, is a, a, a central point in order to show the development of this Judaic element. And a second point, in order to, to, to try to say something about your complicated remark, um, the, I don't know how to say in English, the, the point of, the changing point of this uh, linear, not linear, uh, um, explication uh, and expulsion of um, Judaism is the chapter of in the phenomenology, in which Hegel there is only one place in phenomenology, in, the, in which Hegel 
tales about Judaism and isn't in the religion. There is a sort of uh, strange, it's in the phrenology. And Hegel, in this passage, says something fundamental. The Jew, I, I have the, the, the quotation, but every one knows. Uh, when Hegel say that the Judaism, uh, the, the Jewish people has this a terrible uh, problem that they are in front. There is a, a, a theological metaphor. They are in front, so the theological metaphor in a field in which Hegel is, uh, is um, talking about rationality. The problem is that the Jewish people is in front of the portal, before the portal of salvation. But they don't go on. And what is the consequence of, the, of that? That Judaism has only a possibility. The conversion, the conversion. And conversion in this point means nihilism means the self-negation. Conversion, uh, uh, it, this is interesting because I saw the, the, the English uh, translation say uh, um, inversion, conversion. No? There is an ambiguity. So I think this is a fundamental point into the Hegelian interpretation of Judaism. Why? Because after this point, nothing will be the same. But, but Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Don't you think you completely answered my question, which was that although Hegel says, although Hegel said, um, although Hegel says that he reads Spinoza as an Yuda, in fact he doesn't. A lot of that. That was my point, which he didn't really address. That there are aspects of Hegel's reading of Spinoza, which in Hegel's mind don't belong to Judaism. Now, he might be wrong about Judaism and about Christianity, yeah, 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 okay. but you didn't seem to really address ah, okay, that. Okay, that was my, my point. Yeah, this um, is it. That, that there's more to Hegel Spinoza than is contained in the, fra in the phrase yeah. Alsa and Yuda. That was the point. Okay, yeah. Um, so I can, yeah. It's, I think, more, it's an easier, not really easier point, but I can answer in this way that, in my opinion, this remark on Jewishness of Spinoza is fundamental concerning the notion of unicity. The uh, Spinoza, the, 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 the relationship between uh, uh, Jew, the, the Jewishness of Spinoza and the du Cartesian dualism, this is the point. And I, I, try, to, I try to stress this point. Uh, of course, there are other elements not Jewish in Spinoza, um, also in the TTP, uh, but I, I think that the point doesn't change. Because uh, this assumption is, uh, is essentially uh, at the beginning of the move. So it's a, it's a sort of a game, ch chase game. This is the opening move, it's that. Then there are many other things and possibilities, but this is the first move. <coughs> okay, uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up uh, here because we're late yeah, already, so uh, every remaining questions will have to be answered in private. Um, so thanks again, Giacomo, and thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, no pause here. Uh, we, yes, Emilia Mara is next. Stay in your seats.
Our next, our next speaker is Emilia Mara. Emilia is a former fellow of the IASF in Napoli and the CSAS, CAS RECA. She translated into Italian Mashray's Hegel o Spinoza in 2016, and she wrote a book, Mantenere insieme, Strategia del Sistema nella Francia post-structuralista. Um, the title of her today's lecture is The Interposed Space, the Continuum Between Mathematics and Physics. Uh, Emilia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this presentation. Thank you to uh, each and every one of you for being here. I will try not to abuse of your patience nor your lunch time, so I'll try to <laughs> wrap things up. And, uh, but before starting, let me just thank the organizing team and the international network Helens, uh, Hegel's relevance and all the speakers who already spoke because they offer me the chance to grab pieces of what they said uh, that will be very useful uh, through my uh, presentation. Um, I would love to join the challenge uh, about which we were talking this morning. So the challenge consisting in trying to underline what is really at stake between Hegel and Spinoza nowadays. Uh, whether we think this relation between whether uh, Hegel and Spinoza as a conjunction, as uh, Hegel and Spinoza, et Spinoza, uh, the presence of Spinoza in Hegel, or uh, if we think about, uh, about it as a diastema, so Hegel or Spinoza, other Spinoza, uh, Spinoza as an alternative. So I won't take position between these two uh, options because I think that um, my, mm, I, I can explain the focus of my topic in one word, uh, saying just that I would like to uh, focus on the between, just on the between Hegel and Spinoza substance and um, subject. So for this, for this reason, um, I'd like to do something which is maybe uncommon. So to start this presentation from the very bottom line of my abstract. Uh, in its very last sentence, I state in fact that the Hegelian hesitation on the Spinozan mathematical example of Turing Lettel 12 to Mayer is relevant because of its socio-political implications. More explicitly, I claimed that the theoretical position on the relation between infinite expression and finite expression, unendlicher Ausdruck, unendlicher Ausdruck, reveals different perspectives on the determination of power in society. In this sense, the fundamental alternative noted by Hegel between his philosophy and Spinozism might be taught as a uh, my, sorry, might be thought of as a reflection on how to relate with alterity to Kur. If it is not uncommon nowadays to compare Hegel and Spinoza in their political ventures, credit has to be given to the French Spinozian, Re Spinozian Renaissance throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The allergy to the idea of one history dancing the dialectical waltzer under the cold horizon of teleology led philosophers such as Zach, Guerou, Rousset, Deleuze, Matron, Althusser, Mascret, and Negri to find a different path from what seemed to be the inevitable last dance, the end of history. Meanwhile, the will to move beyond the idea of a main or sole philosophical tradition arose in Greece and accomplished matured in Germany uh, was strongly staked by post-colonial feminist and cultural studies. As Cesare Casarino states, Spinoza became an integral part of the revolutionary zeitgeist. Thanks to its focus on existence, Spinoza's offers precious theoretical instruments to ponder otherness, namely Europe, Europe's great untold. In fact, as Levinas affirms, since its very beginning, philosophy is haunted by the horror of otherness, which has to be seen, according to this tradition, as an absolute being. In other words, the main effort of Western philosophy has always been the attempt to understand the world through reason. Under Hegel's sign, 
the whole process assumed the shapes of self-consciousness, which is identity and autonomy. On the other hand, Spinoza's work might suggest a significantly dissimilar approach to otherness. It is by keeping this frame of mind that I aim to explore the substance-subject relation between Spinoza and Hegel. It is well known that Hegel's main and fundamental objection to Spinoza does not regard his accusation of atheism, but rather his conception that sub substance leads to anachronism. This critique focuses precisely on the relation between substance and subject in Spinoza's works, and it demands an insight into the role played by negation in both Spinozism and Hegelianism. As the first modern philosopher postulating the reality of an absolute substance, Spinoza is considered by Hegel to be the necessary starting point in philosophy, to us and better than Spinozism's other kind of philosophy. On the other hand, the immobility of substance, hence the absence of an accomplished theory of negation, condemns Spinoza to remain a silent and distant precursor. It might be interesting at this point to stress the fact that in Hegel, Spinoza is considered middle ground between the absence of a proper philosophical thinking and the beginning of philosophy, or at least the orient oriental echo, or as Giacomo uh, quoted, an echo from Easter lands, haunting the doctrines of Eliades. I quote from the lesson on the history of philosophy. In Oriental thought, the principal relationship is as follows. The single substance is as such the truth, and the individual in himself is without value and has nothing to gain for himself insofar as he maintains his position and guess what which is in itself for itself. He cannot, on the contrary, have any real value without confounding himself with the substance, the result of which is that substance ceases to exist for the subject, and that the subject itself ceases to be a conscious being and vanishes within the unconscious." End of quote. Not differently, Parmenides, in Hegel's judgment, does not move forward the plenitude of the being and the void of the non-being. I quote, According to Parmenides, whatever form the negative takes, it is nothing at all. The self-sufficiency of substance and its indifference to otherness finds in the Chinese autarctic world a model of closure, which is reflected in what Hegel indicates as 5,000 years of coherent, continuous, stable, and well-documented history. Because of the lack of contacts with the outside world, the absence of rises and falls or significant crises and solutions, Hegel paradoxically states that the Chinese history, with its, with its length, can be thought of as a non-historical experience, precisely because of the immobility of Chinese society. In order to avoid the empty plenitude of the immediate being, which results in its degradation, Hegel offers, offers to the negative its share of reality. In other words, like Chinese cultures excludes itself from the course of history, a metaphysical perspective oblivious to the negative tenders its resignation from philosophy. The Spinozian autarchy, hence the reason of its mobility, consists in the denial of the negative. Rather than recognizing the negative as the necessary intermediary for the positive to come, and I quote from the Science of Logic, Spinoza remains within negation as determinateness or quality. It does not attain a cognition of negation as absolute, that is, self-negating negation. Thus, its substance does not itself contain the absolute form. The knowledge of it is not an immanent knowledge. End of quote. Therefore, Hegel's critique results in stating that Spinoza's substance hides a lack of understanding of the negative as mediator behind its supposed immediate plenitude. In order to offer the positive its own place, negative cannot be avoided nor ignored. 
The Spinozan solution offers emptiness disguised as plenitude, the negation of the whole world clogged as fullness. According to Hegel, the expression omnis determinatio est negatio witnesses Spinozan blindness faced with a real role of negation and forces the absolute into its own degradation. As a consequence, Spinoza is both the beginning and the debacle of philosophical thinking, as the analysis of the two beginnings of the ethics, namely Proposition 1 and Proposition 6, easily shows. The concept of causa sui and the way in which Spinoza thinks God, thinks of God, are in fact the premise and the failure of contradiction, which is, for Hegel, the only possible rational path Cause and effect, infinite and finitude, go from an abstract opposition to a non-rational solution, avoiding the productive spiral of contradiction. In its place, a powerless and unfruitful opposition arises, only to be immediately and magically solved. In Hegel's words, Spinozism is a beautiful example of philosophy shot out of a pistol and it does not offer a better understanding of otherness nor alterity. I quote again, it makes short work of other points of view simply by understanding of otherness nor alterity. No, sorry. <laughs> it makes short work of other points of view simply by explaining that it is to take no notice of them. This affirmation might surprise Spinoza's readers. How can Hegel ignore that the plurality of points of view is foundational to the state for Spinoza and that this plurality does not need to be suppressed? How can he forget about the, the ambivalence in the relation between man and man who, according to Spinoza, are at the very same time wolf and God to each other? Moreover, Spinoza's praise for democracy is based on the argument that democracy is the only government where no one renounces his or her natural rights without subsequently being consultant and remain equal to others as he or she was in the state of nature. Pierre Macheret states that the misunderstanding lies in an undeserved extension of the concept of determination from a very specific, a specific example, the figure explained in letter 12 to Mayer, to the attributes. In fact, what sounds scandalous for Hegel is the idea that attributes, and thought in particular, are subordinated to absolute substance. Where Spinoza writes, and I quote, by attribute I mean that which the intellect perceives of the substance as constituting its essence, Hegel reads that thought doesn't exist beyond the, beyond the in, in intellect that perceives it. For the German philosopher, this leads to both a conceptual and a logical contradiction. On the one hand, thought is anything but representation, external to the substance, thus necessarily incomplete. On the other, the nature of the attribute depends on a mode, even if technically attributes should precede modes. The logical consequence for Hegel is that substance cannot be subject. Without any determination, substance cannot be thought of as a totality, and conversely, the subject cannot be substance as it is determined, hence limited. Before focusing on these objections, showing, as it has been done already by convincing critics, where and how Hegel forces Spinoza's example of letter 12, I would like to widen the scope or what is really at stake in this debate. The whole diatribe on the infinite is, in fact, the necessary gateway through which Spinoza must pass in order to answer the following question. If substance is infinite, why and how does the finite exist? As Hegel understands it, there is, in fact, a fundamental anti-Aristotelian tension in Spinoza's conception of the infinite, and, but you notice this, if Aristotle doesn't need to prove the existence of infinity, as he does not think that the infinite exists at all, Spinoza 
cannot affirm that the infinite exists without wondering how finitude can be there as well. If it is considered an immediate donation, finitude needs to be explained. In other words, Spinoza needs to multiply the non-substantial forms of being and non-being, namely infinite and finitude, eternity and temporality, unity and multiplicity. In letter 12, Hegel finds precisely the polysemy of the infinite in Spinoza, even if, in his words, this polysemy plays an ontological role which cannot be associated to Spinoza without frictions. On Hegel's side, what is at stake here is the co-generation of the finite and the infinite, namely the starting point of the science of logic. In fact, it would be a mistake to forget the determinateness, bestimmed height, which is the act through which determinacy takes place, is the beginning of the whole dialectics on infinite. In other words, the being conceived as determined is the necessary point of departure of a thought meant to dissolve determinateness itself in order to go beyond it. The fundamental point here is that the determinateness above has to exist. Obviously, existence is the necessarily ontological premise needed in order to get to an infinite other than the infamous bad infinite. It is by keeping this theoretical frame in mind that I would like now to introduce the Spinozan example and Hegel's conclusions on it. As, mentions, as, as mentioned in letter 12 to Mayer, known as letter on the infinite, Spinoza deals with the figure as a particular form of determination where this latter can be thought of as a limit. The path for an adequate understanding of the relation between infinite and finite is offered by Spinoza through the geometrical example of two unequal circles, one inside the other but not concentric. The variation that can be appreciated be between the segment AB and CD, namely the two distances between the circles, cannot be defined by a number, precisely because of its continuous movement. In this letter, mathematicians are praised not only for their ability in finding things that cannot be explained nor equated to any number, but especially because they recognize the particular nature of these things that cannot, uh, that erupt, oh, recognize the particular nature of these things that cannot be expressed by a number. The example shows how a limited surface cannot be Sorry. Where imagination finds contradictions and paradoxes, the intellect can solve the problem through the notion of continuity. As Spinoza makes clear in letter 50, the determination of a figure is a, is a process of the mind, and in this sense, it can be said that, and I quote, the determination therefore does not pertain the thing according to its being, but on the contrary, it is its non-being. In other words, the figure as determination is a negation, since it is a limit posed by something else. On this basis, Hegel states that every determination is a negation, and that attributes in particular are nothing but partial points of view on substance. Jumping to this conclusion means to speeding things up. In fact, attributes are infinite themselves, as they don't limit each other, Therefore, their essence does not imply negation. Regarding modes, it is important to specify that, for Spinoza, it is only by the means of imagination that we can think about bodies or minds as separate from each other. In its impossibility to grasp the infinite, imagination forces the allness of the absolute to parcel out, making it result in a discontinuous succession of modes. Nevertheless, modes as attributes express the infinite substance, and it is only from an abstract point of view that they can be seen as reciprocal limits. For instance, when imagination tries to determine quantity, as first degree of knowledge, it has no choice but to represent this a composition of parts. However, intellect conceives it in terms of substance, thus finding it, and I quote, infinite, unique, 
and single. There are three passages in which Hegel focuses on this mathematical example, in both editions of the Science of Logic and in his lectures on the history of philosophy. The Spinozan attempt to think the infinite outside the limits of imagination is celebrated by virtue of its ability to go beyond, and I quote, a foggy and obscure, and obscure image of the infinite borrowed from the finite. However, between the first and the second edition of the Science of Logic, a variation that is anything but incident incidental appears. The space between the circumferences in Italy presented as infinite because the nature of the thing transcends all determinacy is thought of in the second edition as infinite but limited as well. In both editions, the infinity of imagination is contrasted with the infinity of thought or infinitum actu, vollende und gegenwärtig. This Hegelian interpretation, confirmed with an even freer gesture in the lectures, recognized the importance of the Spinozan focus on determination, but forced the contours of the proposed example by bending it in the direction of a of a finite quantum that exceeds whatever number is assigned to it. The Spinozan emphasis placed on the constant variation in the distance between the two circumferences falls into background here, allowing Hegel to deviate from, the, from that, and I quote, intensive infinity, which designate the immanentistic trajectory, whose risk is to sacrifice determination to the continuous. The move is played through, uh, through Kant. In the second edition of the Science of Logic, a reference to the latter author, which was absent in the first, makes its appearance. Indeed, Kant's critique of, quantity inf of quantitative infinity offers an opportunity to think of infinity as a relation in a non-mathematical but physical sense. So with Newton, not Leibniz. The relation between infinite and finite resolves itself in the true infinite through the dynamic process of the negation of the negation, which ends in the proper affirmation of the infinite. Therefore, it is not enough for Hegel to state that there is not a qualitative difference between infinite and finite, nor that this relation of recipro reciprocal limitation ends in unity. In order to understand the very nature of this process, of this process, one must focus on the reflexive structure, on this movement, movement of coming back, whose main example is consciousness. Hegel's intention should be clear by now. Since the infinite expression is to be found in the finite expression and not in an infinite series, the variation in scale proposed by Spinoza is therefore inadequate in rendering the co-genesis of finite and infinite. It is only by thinking determinatus as a reality, thus in the physical world, that the concept of infinity can be thought of as a synonym of absolute. Geometrical abstraction is of no help to Hegel's intentions, and the concept of continuous cannot play a role in the very first part of, of a reflection of infinite, which has to come together with the genesis of finitude. As a consequence, as a consequence continuous variation is dismissed, and the dialogue collapses into a monologue. And I quote from the lectures of the history of philosophy. Spinoza also introduces some geometrical examples here as clarification of the concept of infinity. In his posthumous works, for example, he provides a figure as image of this infinity, even before his ethics. He sets out two circles, one lying within the other without being concentric. The surface between the two cannot be deduced. It cannot be expressed in a determinate relation. It is not commensurable. If I want to determine it, I must proceed to the infinite, an infinite series. This is the beyond, that's in house, which is always defective, affected with negation. And yet, this bad infinite is complete, fertile, circumscript, uh, affirmative, present in this surface. The affirmative is thus negation of the negation, duplex negatio affirmativa, 
following the, the well-known grammatical rule. The space between the two circles is actual. It is a circums circumscribed space, entirely and not just on one side. And yet, the determination of the space cannot be sufficiently indicated by a number. The determinate does not create the space itself, and nevertheless, it is present. Or again, a line, a bounded line, consists of an infin infinity of multiple points, and nevertheless, it is present and it is determined. The infinite must be represented as actually present. The concept of cause in itself is thus true actuality. As soon as the cause has another just opposed to it, the effect of finitude is present, but in this case, this other is at the same time surpassed and it becomes once more the cause itself. End of quote. Do I have 10 minutes? Uh, five. Have more like five minutes. Okay. In this passage, the determinate, the, uh, sorry. In this passage, the determinate progression of the variation between a minimum and a maximum considered by Spinoza in his mathematical example gives way to the space between the two circumference which, as Machuret wrote, and I quote, is constituted through an infinity of unequal distances and which is nevertheless complete and present because it is compressed within fixed limit. Thus, the differences introduced by Spinoza in order to avoid contradictions, symptoms of misunderstanding and logical mistakes, rather than necessarily in gene for rational thought, are resemantized and partially ignored in favor of the infinite enact injected by Hegel. Imagination does not move forward the distinction between infinite and unlimited, between infinite as unlimited and finite as limited. What imagination cannot see is that finite does not exist outside its cause, which is infinity, independently from any abstract determination. On the contrary, the intellect seeks, seeks the infinite in the variation that is continuous but limited, not because of this limitation, namely because of the negative determination constituted by an entity for another, but rather through its cause, the power of a cause acting within it. The notion of intensive infinite as an immanent infinite emerges here, not non opposita sed diversa, from the extensive infinite. Therefore, Spinoza suggests that intellect sees the continuity not only in this example, but in all modal reality, because the infinitive substance does not split into parts, but it, it expresses itself completely in all its mode. Moreover, the substance expresses itself in its attributes and modes simultaneously, even if, as far as substance is concerned, existence appertains to its essence. As Spinoza states in letter 12 to Mayer, the definition of modes cannot involve any existence, hence, though they exist, they can conceive, we can conceive them as non-existent. Therefore, modes are not parts of the substance, but every singularity is already in the light of the infinite, of the eternity, because it is an effect of the substance. Because it lives inside the, this relation and expresses it, a mode also lives in unity with other modes. Modes exist in relations of affection between bod bodies and other bodies, between mind and other minds, as stated in ethics. In other words, it can be said that even if Spinoza and Hegel share a focus on relation between finite and infinite, their solution do not overlap. Where Hegel sees a cycle, namely the process of negation of negation, starting from finitude and ending with the affirmative infinite throughout reflection, Spinoza claims a unity from the very beginning, because the only infinite substance is the one and holy cause of the finitude itself which cannot be seen from an in in inadequate point of view, namely the imagination's point of view. One of the many consequences that can be deduced is a fundamental difference in approaching anthropology. If the very first confrontation with otherness is signed by negation in Hegel to the point that the absence of conflicts with other cultures excludes China from history, in Spinoza, an anthropology of solidarity prevails. 
Men must help one another, as they are effect of the same cause from the very beginning. In Hegel, a relation's polarities necessarily resolve into each other, as it strengthens the subject. While in Spinoza, relation can be viewed in absence of a teleology, leading to two possible outcomes. In Mariana de Gainza's words, Hegel's critique reacts in two different fashions. On the one hand, the process of, it, of differentiation immanent to an infinite power of production can be considered as a process of determination that is realized through progressive negations. On the other hand, differentiation is thought of as a process of expression that is carried out through distinctions. However, the risk inherent to this alternative is precisely to dissolve the infinite variation, the necessarily openness of the process of individuation in Spinoza. Throughout the Hegelian path, the only logical conclusion is acosmism. Finitude of things or individuals ends in disruption. On the other hand, the risk is to elevate things to a full and divine plenitude, where the distinction between modes and substance, individuals and God, falls aside. Professor Miriam Binnenstock talked about the egoist. It is instead by dwelling in the indefinite of Spinoza's dramatical example that it is possible to suspend the decision in favor of determination as negation or expression as affirmation in order to really appreciate the individual as the immanent effect of the process of individuation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilia, for, for this uh, intriguing and precise lecture. Now, are there questions? There should be. Okay, Zanan first. Um, thanks a lot for this interesting lecture, which I really enjoyed. Um, I just want to begin with a little bit provocative question, because uh, there is something in your uh, talk which I really can follow and, and share. A kind of, if I would, uh, if I'm able to um, name it as such, a kind of mixture of a Bodhusian and Masharian approach. But at some point, you just said that, like uh, attributing to Spinoza, equality just as in the nature. If I'm not wrong, like attributing equality to a kind of a state of nature uh, feature, like just mm. in the state of nature. And the problem is, and this is, I think, if we just uh, read Spinoza in such a way, there is a, there is a um, danger of regression in a kind of uh, pseudo-nature romanticism, which is a part of, I would say, a kind of left liberal ideo ideology, which just, um, which just dissolves in, in, the, in the given uh, ideologies of, of the uniqueness or like uh, something like this. And there, I would just want, would like to uh, challenge it by Hegel, because is, isn't he the one who just reminds us that the thought of concrete universality, the fact that we are humans, not because we are Jews, we are Greeks, or we are Italians or Germans, whatever, but just be because we are humans, just took millennia to grasp. So if we talk about equality, how far can we really just bring it back or trace it back to a kind of a state of nature quality? Isn't it like the most unnatural uh, at all, like what would you say? Thank you very much, very interesting question. Uh, yeah, so um, I want to, uh, the reason why I address this topic is that uh, at the very beginning of letter 50, the letter to Yeles I quoted together with the letter 12, there is a reference to uh, Ops anthropology. So this is something that is already in Spinoza's mind while uh, talking about this difference between finite and infinite, that's why I take the liberty to use it. And I didn't say that it is the same thing, but that uh, in the state of nature, uh, of course the opposition, is, is, it is against Hobbes. So the idea is that in the state of nature there is a regime of equality between men, and this regime still exists in democracy because it is not uh, offering the power to someone else that uh, somebody renounced to his or her rights. So in this sense, 
there is something uh, which led people being closer to the state of nature uh, if we compare it with um, the option anthropology. That's what I wanted to underline. So this is not uh, thought of as um, an evolution from a starting point where everybody was equal and then a sort of rational up upgrade were renouncing to something, some, something else uh, arise. Uh, but it's ra uh, rather um, this complication in Spinoza, this uh, uh, presence, presence that cannot be just exposed from uh, his way of thinking. Um, yeah. So, and yes, of course, um, this is uh, one of the points where Hegel is closer to Spinoza. Uh, the reason why I enjoy Mashres and Badius uh, readings of this uh, relation is that they do not, say, so they focus on where they are closer, which is very interesting, and that's exactly what I wanted to state here. So it is not a question of taking sides or saying uh, who's approaching the philosophical uh, matter in a better way, but uh, rather it is about trying to, uh, if you allow me to use a, a an expression of Don Haraway's expression, staying in the trouble, staying with the trouble, staying there. And I think that this is a way in which, uh, with this rhetorical strategy, we can think about the presence of Spinoza in Hegel, and that's the reason why this is so interesting, because it is not about solving Spinoza, it's not about uh, excluding Spinoza or giving Spinoza a place, an exact place that Hegel decides to deal with Spinozism, but it is uh, by um, um, reading Spinoza and fighting with Spinoza and trying to find alliance with Spinoza that he understands that there's something interesting for philosophy to occur there. Thank you. So do we have uh, the question? No? Quick, quick question. question. Yes, yes, Mrs. Sorry. Mara, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I would like to stay a little bit in the problem, as you just quoted. And for that, uh, I, would, I would like to instrumentalize you a little bit. Um, because uh, if I see it correctly, uh, there is a big uh, difference between your approach uh, to the relationship between Hegel and Spinoza and that of um, Mr. Pataka. Um, couldn't we say that this remark, als ein Jude, is completely irrelevant for your analysis? The whole discussion on Judaism is completely irrelevant for your discussion. You focus on the notion of, uh, let's say, the absolute uh, and its abstract character. And from there, you, so to say, you start your, your elaboration. You do not want to decide, you want to say, so to say, you want to stay into the trouble. But nevertheless, we now have these two different approaches, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what is your position now towards the alternative who tries to reduce, so to say, the whole discussion Spinoza, uh, Hegel, with regard to the absolute, to a matter of worldview or religion? Uh, and then develop an argument whether the interpretation of Judaism is correct or not. I, I would. I would say that is for you completely irrelevant. Uh, but still, we now have these two completely different approaches. So how do we solve this problem, please? <laughs> In less than five minutes, right? <laughs> the, the method is enough. Well, um, the reason why uh, I didn't focus on that, um, so the main reason, I think that because I have always been fascinated by the main accusation that Hegel uh, addressed to Spinoza, which is uh, not common at that time. It's not the accusation of being a, Judy, a, uh, a Juden, it's not the accusation of atheism, it's the accusation of acosmism, which from my point of view uh, is extremely interesting because I found that determinateness and the concept of a limit and uh, alternative as the alternative, so the uh, possibility to uh, think about uh, the alter, the otherness, and the generation of the other or the presence of the other, 
uh, is the most interesting aspect from my point of view that can uh, we can bring into the discussion nowadays. So I think that uh, that kind of approach doesn't suit my um, um, my aims just because it is too limited. Uh, it's uh, extremely precise uh, and uh, it goes back to um, a field of confrontation discussions uh, which I cannot um, uh, approach with the uh, right instruments because I, I feel that uh, this is a, a huge debate that I cannot manage uh, without the proper instruments. So I think that's why I choose this other path with, of course, led to something else. I don't know if I answered that, just the approach I had. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. We have to wrap this up, the discussion now. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, Very, uh, I, okay, I, I would like to very informally thank uh, a lot uh, Professor Scott and Mediati for the invitation for being here and also uh, uh, for all the contact on the organization. to express my uh, happiness and my honor for being here today. So, uh, I will be louder. <laughs> well, truth and method, Hegel's reading of Spinoza. Uh, first about, it's okay like that, thank you. Uh, first about the more uh, geometrical corsets. And all the geometric demonstrators' expositions, such as that of Spinoza's ethics, implies that a seemingly minor change in one of his postulates or the admission is valid of a change of the theorem may result in an integral transformation of the discipline and its results. In the case of such a particular change in the geometric exposition of Spinoza's ethics, resulting in a radical transformation of the discipline, uh, I would like to speak of a non-metaphysic, uh, a non-Spinozist metaphysics, by analogy with a non-Euclidean non geometry. In this paper, I will propose to highlight an analogous change that transformed Spinoza's ethics into something entirely different, all right, preserving some of the most important philosophical purposes of Spinoza's ethics. In the panorama of the end of the 18th century, one can find a double image in Spinoza's reception. On the one hand, nature's generative capacity and dynamic inferiority infinity were stressed in correspondence with the notion of substance as Deo Siva Natura and the distinction between Natura Naturans and Natura Naturata. Accordingly, early uh, romanticism, romanticism had, had made, and I quote her mother, which is, who is present here, uh, romanticism had made a generalized image, image of Spinozism in the form of a romantic pantheism, a living cosmos and organic unity. In contrast to that, another reading was present, based in part on the issue of the geometric method. I refer to the interpretation by Jacobi, who, who understood Spinoza's thought as atheism and his substance as inert and productive and unpersonal. As you know, one could hardly exaggerate the influence of Jacobi's reading, so one could not speak of Spinoza in German idealism, including its reception by Hegel, without starting with a reference to that reading. Due to his method and the, and the completeness and perfection of his exposition, according to Jacobi, at least until the appearance of Fichte, Spinoza was the philosopher par excellence who took the co coherence of pure understanding to its ultimate consequences. Jacobi thus subscribes to the oft-quoted claim, which he repeatedly attributes to Lessing, that there is no other philosophy than the philosophy of Spinoza. The motto, Hen Kai Pan, would contain that philosophy about which, according to Jacobi, Lessing said, I know, I know of nothing else. 
One should remark that Hegel will explicitly assent to this interpretation in his lessons in the history, on the history of philosophy, where he's conf he confirms the already quoted today sentence that Spinoza is Hauptpunkt der modernen Philosophie, entweder Spinozismus oder keine Philosophie. Thus, both the Aufklärung, as we may generalize from Jacobi's letters to Mr. Mendelssohn, and under his influence, classical German philosophy, understood Spinoza's ordine geometrico ethics as one highest point of modern philosophy is in, in its entire coherence. According to Spinoza's reception in Jacobian classical German philosophy, the more geometrical system of the ethics is a totally, totality of mediation by the understanding. Jacobi defining the understanding as the faculty of mediation, given that, according to the latter, only immediate knowledge, which is inaccessible to understanding, can produce the truth. The Spinozist system, and with, all, with it all philosophy in general, lacks any truth. The substances live in a productive nature on the one hand, and its sterility due to a method dependent on integral mediation by the understanding on the other, are therefore the primary and contradictory data confronting Hegel's reception of Spinoza. The transformation of Spinoza's system by Hegel focuses thus on three points. First, uh, firstly, it preserves in a different way the romantic notion of an infinite and radical productivity of the substance. Second, it accepts Jacobi's criticisms that the immobility of Spinoza's substance is due mainly to the inadequacy of the purely intellectual and external method. Third, with, while wholly accepting the criticism of the mediation by the understanding, Hegel directly opposes Jacobi's conception that only immediate knowledge can comprehend the truth. Considering Hegel's responses to these three essential points, we may define him also as a Spinozist. Hegel remains a Spinozist to the extent he submits these critical points from Spinoza to a methodological transformation which preserves them while grounding them in an entirely different and more comprehensive way. As said, first, Hegel changes the conception of the substance by linking together its infinity to its, and its productivity. Second, these changed conceptions comes together with a changed methodological approach. Third, finally, against Jacobi, Hegel categorically refuses that one should find in immediate knowledge an answer to the insufficiency of the mediation by the understanding. By showing the insufficiency of the understanding, philosophy should not go back to immediate knowledge, but beyond it towards, toward reason as the negation of negation. In answer to this problem, Hegel gave a new form to philosophical rationality. Therefore, once one decisive postulate of Spinoza's ethics, as said, has, has been changed, we can read Hegel as uh, the Spinoza of contemporary times, as he proposes a system with equal coherence and completeness, and completeness as Spinoza's. However, even more significant than just a methodological change in philosophy, the change proposed by Hegel does not constitute an alternative system of philosophy, but the shift of episteme. Philosophy being as known as you know, it's on time apprehended in thoughts, as Hegel in the philosophy of Christ says, this transformation corresponds to a transition from a modern episteme and the world conceived on a foundational unity of principle and substance to another episteme and another conception of reality, which integrates the freedom of the singular conflict, complexity, and negativity. Thus, Hegel's thought allows us to encompass significantly different factors from Spinoza's world. Hegel's logic can incorporate negation and contradiction as a central element through that transformation. Hegel's metaphysics, endowed with negativity, allows us to understand reality from a much broader and more realistic perspective, opening, opening it to understanding conflict and concrete historicity. To understand this, cha this change most simply, I began, by, I began by suggesting that a single specific change in one of X theorems could, by analogy with the non-Euclidean ordine geometrico of Gauss and others, completely alter the system of philosophy. I propose to, exp to expose Spinoza's critical reception by Hegel precisely based on such a small change. The element to be changed is the proposition four of the third book. This proposition states that, I quote, 
nothing can be destroyed except through an external cause. End of quotation. The proof of this theorem reads as follows. I quote, this proposition is evident through itself, is evident from itself, for the definition of anything affirms and does not deny the thing's essence, or it posits the thing's essence and does not take it away. End of quotation. Hegel shows instead that this proposition is not evident at all, but everything finite must be destroyed through an internal cause, and that its essence and substance are precisely, precisely the absolute negativity of being, or absolute negativity of being. Despite some possible arguments in, to the contrary in the, in, in the literature regarding dialectical factors in Spinoza's thought, Proposition 3-4 of the Ethics corresponds to a stance coherent with Spinoza's geometric and analytical method. To ground my approach, I must then contrast it with some passage from Hegel's Science of Logic stating the opposite. Indeed, contrary to the claim that uh, Spinoza's claim that nothing can be destroyed except through an external cause, we read in Hegel's logic that, I quote, something behaves in relation to the other through itself. Since otherness is posited in it, in it as its own moment, it in itselfness holds negation in itself. End of quotation. That is how Hegel intends to overturn Spinoza. Hegel continues, I quote, finite things are are, but in their reference to themselves, they refer to themselves negatively. In this very self-reference, they propel themselves beyond themselves, beyond their being. The hour of their birth is the hour of their death. End of quotation. As a consequence of this change, Hegel opposes Aufhebung to the Spinozis Conatus and Perseverare. According to Hegel, things do not tend to persevere in their being, but to sublate their limits. And that's the whole difference. Now on the adventures of the substance. Contrary to some critics of Hegel, however, the question is not of opposing negativity to Spinozist's positivity and of persevering in the negative, in, as Hegel, quoting Hegel, in the sorrow of finitude, the uh, trauer der Endlichkeit, as Hegel says. Instead, the understanding, not dialectical reason, perseveres in the negative. I quote, the understanding persists in this sorrow of finitude, for it makes non-being the determination of things, and at the same time, this non-being imperishable and absolute, end of quotation. Furthermore, I quote again, the perishing, the nothing, is rather not the last of it, uh, that is, the finite. The perishing rather perishes, end of quotation. Albeit founded upon negation, Aufhebung does not mean to persevere in the negative, in simple opposition to persevering in the positivity of the essence, as in Spinoza. Aufhebung is a link, is a link between the positive and the negative, not a simple opposition to the positive. According to Hegel, the conception of negativity as definitive and disconnected from the positive is a form of mediation through the understanding, or instead, it shows the impossibility of mediating opposites through the understanding. Hegel's conception of the essence as pure negativity implies the double negation, i.e., negation's negation. Such conception explains why essence perseveres and changes as double negation. It negates otherness and infinitely reaffirms itself. That is why essence is not positive being, as Spinoza seems to conceive it, uh, but must be defined by negativity. Spinoza continues his demonstration in Proposition 3.7 by identifying the conatus with the essence. I quote, the striving by which each thing strives to persevere in its being is nothing but the actual essence of the thing, end of quotation. As he inverts Spinozism to recover its tenets more coherently, Hegel defines essence on the contrary, not only as negation, but as pure negativity. I quote, but essence is the absolute negativity of being. This negativity, which, it, which is identical with immediacy, and thus the immediacy, which is identical with negativity, is essence, end of quotation. 
if essence was simple being, it could not persevere since being once determined must pass away into its other, and that's the problem with Spinoza's definition. Only by negate, negating otherness can being persevere. But as it negates otherness, being is the essence as negativity, as Hegel defines it. Hegel states that only this conception of the essential presence of negativity in the substance allows us to understand the speculative content of Spinoza's notion of causa sui. The expression causa sui means that the cause produces its effect as the other of itself, but identifies itself again in the effect as that other. It first negates itself to posit its other, but then negates the other to assert itself again, and that's essence. Uh, I should now present passages. Well, now I should present passages or a proposition in the science of logic, as I, uh, I done before, capable of substantiating the diametrical opposition of proposition four above of book three of Spinoza's ethics. Well, as I did before. Incidentally, I remark that is quite an easy task. It was very easy to do that. The only difficulty lies in choosing one among the, indefin among the indefinite number of possible propositions. The experience of searching in the science of logic for a statement to this effect shows that almost any sentence belonging to the, to the argumentation of the science of logic can be quoted as an explicit position against the proposition above in Spinoza's ethics. This fact shows that the change in proposition 3.4 implies a reconfiguration of philo philosophical method and procedures that affects the organic nature of thought at each step and in all the, its details as in the science of logic. Of the three issues mentioned uh, at the beginning, i.e. the renewal of the conception of the method the productivity of the substance, and free the problem of immediate knowledge due to, lack, due to lack of available time, I can only deal now with the first one, the renewal of the conception of the method. Uh, now I talk about Hegel in, Hegel's integrative method. Hegel conceives the geometric method as a set of rules and assumptions applicable from the outside to its object. It is the paradigm of what he calls external reflection. By proposing the use of dialectics, Hegel undertakes a genetic methodological change in such a way as to alter the, uh, all the essential points of the method. Unlike the, geomet the geometrical, the uh, mos dialecticus, A does not consist of rules, B has no assumptions, C does not admit of application, and D much less from outside the object. So it's not a set of rules and assumptions applicable from the outside to its object. Everything is. For these reasons, all centers in the science of logic are instances of statements opposite to Spinoza's propositions 3.4. As a general result of these features, I will define the Hegelian speculative method as integrative in the most consequence comprehensive sense. This integrative capacity manifests itself in different ways. I will highlight three kinds of integrations relevant to understanding Hegel's Spinoza's reception. Uh, A, since it concerns the exercise we are now practicing, the first kind of integration to mention characterizes the study of historical philosophical issues. This study must be carried out uh, upon hermeneutically founded conceptions. Well, and here uh, my Anspielung um, my and, and Gadamer could find some development if I had time. The critical reception of the history of philosophy requires a clear conceptual framework and systemic integration. The integrative capacity of the method must give the history of philosophy a defined categorical meaning. Removing the, removing the study of the different authors from the domain of contingency, arbitrariness, or museological interest. Therefore, one should not apprehend the history of philosophy as a random development, but as a relatively rational succession of, of principles, 
as you know, and the science of logic exposes the category of objective thought according to an, an order analogous to the course of the history of philosophy. I quote, the same development of thinking that is portrayed in the history of philosophy is also portrayed in philosophy itself, only freed from its, its historical externality, purely in the element of thinking, end of quotation. As with other authors, Hegel's confrontation with Spinoza occurs in two different moments. The lecture of the history of philosophy explicitly presents historical critical materials extracted directly from the studied author's work. In that material, Hegel identifies the conceptual core of the author's thought, which makes it possible to prescribe its place in the development of the history of thought, its antecedents and consequences, as well as to criticize the insufficiencies of the development and speculative understanding of its specific principles. Given the parallelism between the history of philosophy and the science of logic, the latter articulates a new exposition of the same principles according to, the, to an ordering of pure thought, which does not follow the proper historical philosophical order and materials. And that should be necessary in any hermeneutic, in any founded hermeneutics. Hegel's the, Hegel thus defines clear hermeneutical parameters and explains the meaning structure that elucidates the history of philosophy. The integrative procedure, therefore, follows a speculative relation between the logical and the historical philosophical domains. We often find in the literature criticism of Hegel's assimilation of the history of philosophy. Regarding Spinoza's reading, one can read, for, for example, and I quote again from Mr from Mr. Moden to synthesize the idea. For example, that in a way, Hegel's reading is non-historical and unreliable. That is to say, it's most certainly a reading that takes us away from the immediate letter of the text and its historical context, often in an, an, an ashamed and quite apparent attempt at developing Hegel's own philosophical thesis. And yet, it does not do so by picking out useful positions and concepts and separating them from others, end of quotation. It does so according to a categorical ordering made explicit in the science of logic. This modeling of the object of study by a critical perspective on history is not a hermeneutic, a her a a arbitrary caprice, 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 but grounds on Hegel's categorical order which must frame the meaning of the historical context. That seeming freedom of ex in expounding the author or other author's thesis is clearly defined and justified by the divergence between logic and history of philosophy. Although closely related, related there is a Spinoza specific to the science of logic and a Spinoza belonging to the lectures of, on the history of philosophy. The approach to the history of philosophy is a process of subsuming and an inherence, Hegel thematizes in the logic, of simultaneous subsuming, subsuming of historical content under logic determinations in the process of universalization of the particular, and on the other hand, of the inherence of the determination of thinking in the specific historical contexts, thus particularizing logical contents. Only in this way can one judge read philosophical questions and seek answers. That is the practice of reading philosophy's history as Hegel's systematic and integrative procedure tries to explain. Without this double key, hermeneutics would be an arbitrary and ultimately blind exercise. Now uh, about the second integrative um, way of Hegel's method. We should refer to a second integrative function, the already mentioned conception of the method as an inseparable, inseparable connection between the content and form of the exposition. As mentioned above, the science of logic constructs all its propositions in such a way as to exemplify that each determination of thinking contains within itself its own negation not require any, I quote, any, oh, oh, the, any external cause, as in Spinoza, i.e. an external principle for its sublation. Integration means that this connection between form and content is carried out in actu by the cognitive subject and that the science of logic explicitly accounts for this same integrative connection. The conditions of linguistic meaning, especially of philosophical praxis, must always be made explicit in the logical categories. 
That is what logic is about. As expected, one can explain the relation between method and object, referring to the categories of form and matter explicitly addressed to in the doctrine of essence. The, of con the concept of content presented as a unity of form and matter, or as I quote, informed matter or form that possesses subsistence, on the quotation, bridges the gap between matter and form. Content is both in one, matter and form. That is why the method, as a way of thinking, is, is present and affects every moment of the exposition or, or the content. Logic does not deal with a matter to which a method consistent of rules grounded on another source of knowledge would be applied, but it has a content that already consists of the unity between form and matter. For this reason, this unity between method and exposition permeates the entire work, and as we have noticed, the whole argument builds upon it. Three, beside OC, besides this two, this, these two kinds of methodological integration of the epistemological procedures, historical, philosophical, and between logical form and matter, a third kind of integration is especially significant to understand Hegel's reception of Spinoza. Indeed, that is the most crucial innovation of dialectics, as opposed to Spinoza's Mos Geometricus. This integration could be summarized in a quote from Fichte in 1810. I quote from Fichte, if a philosophy does not mention itself, it must deny itself, end of quotation. The point is critical so that this could be an emblematic motto of German idealism. What is missing in Spinoza is the mention of philosophy itself. How does, does the philosopher knows what he has, how does the philosopher know what he asserts? Regardless of the more geometric intellectual rigor characteristic of the ethics, it misses the essence of any truly philosophical method, reflecting on the philosopher's own procedure. And because speculation is a form of reflection, Spinoza's method, since it's not reflective, does not qualify as speculative, although the speculative virtuality of his conception of causa sui, as Hegel stresses in the, in the history of philosophy. Moreover, given that the method is not external and prior to thought, but pervades it and constitutes the architecture of the content itself down to its details, this problem of the non-integration of philosophy in the exposition is an issue that affects the content of Spinoza's ethics. Indeed, due to lack, lack of integration of the cognitive subjects, thought hangs in the air, outside substance and content, i.e. external to truth, without any place of reason for existing. The content becomes abstract. Hegel says that, I quote, the movement of knowledge as a proof falls outside the propositions that should be the truth. That negative self-conscious moment, the movement of knowledge which pursues its, its, which pursues its ways, its, its way in the thought which is present before us is, however, certainly lacking of the content of Spinoza's philosophy, or at least it is only externally associated with it since it falls within its self-consciousness. That is to say, thoughts form uh, the content, but they are not self-conscious thoughts or concepts." End of quotation. The problem with Spinoza's geometric method is the lack of integration of the subject, which affects the conception of truth in both authors. For Hegel, Spinoza did not resolve the problem, which displays an essential discontinuity in the philosophical turn towards the 19th century. century. Historically, it involves the beginning of Hegel's systematic philosophical vocation and the transformation of Schelling's and Fichte's philosophy, especially the, the, the latter, as mentioned, as, in, as it's apparent in the introduction to his Wissenschaftslehre of, of uh, 1812, but also increasingly in Hegel, the question is how to understand the integration of the subjective Sub subjective thought in any of its cognitive, epistemological, or historical dimensions in the content that philosophy studies. The phenomenology of spirits uh, of 1870 is obviously a response to this very same problem. 
Regarding the lack of integration of the cognitive subject for Spinoza, I quote, the human mind is a part of the infinite intellect of God. Therefore, when we say that the human mind perce perceives this or that, we are saying nothing but that God has this or that idea. Proposition through, uh, 211 in his corollary, corollary. Moreover, the soul is for Spinoza the idea of the body. This conception defines the knowing soul as the unique, uh, as the, the knowing soul as a mode of the unique substance. However, Hegel's criticism is that it does not truly integrate the cognitive subjects, the soul, into the substance. Integration is lacking because the relationship, the relationship between substance and mode is not made explicit. Integration, um, because the substance is unproductive, quoting Hegel, everything proceeds inwards and not outwards. No reason is given for the substance to express itself in its attributes and modes. Quote from Hegel, the determinations are not developed from substance, it does not resolve itself into these attributes, end of quotation. Spinoza is aware that one should explain the cognitive subject if, subject, if not at the level of the status of philosophy itself, at least of perception. Therefore, the cognitive subject is said to belong to the one substance. Still, since as mentioned, the latter is not productive, Spinoza is in depth to convey, to convey how and why this happens. That is one insufficiency pointed out to Spinoza, which Hegel's intent to respond to by the phenomenology of spirit. The issue is to raise the finite thought into the absolute knowledge and the pure element of science, followed by the exposition of determinations of thought as objective thoughts, not as representations belonging to some contingent particular finite subject anymore. For logical thought determinations to be considered objective thoughts, not subjective representations, one must overcome the separation between subject and object and the pure logical element must be developed without presuppositions or the application of rules external to the logical content. But I couldn't elaborate further on this topic. According to Hegel, Spinoza failed in this integration process, especially in the cognitive and epistemological dimensions. Hegel seeks to resolve this problem through the transformation as mentioned above of the method and through the phenomenology of spirit, which, which is an exhaustive proposal, proposal of integrating the cognitive subject into the object of knowledge. Now to the conclusion, uh, uh, three epigraphs. Fichte is saying, quoted above, that if a philosophy does not mention itself, it must deny itself expresses a central concern of German idealism of integrating the subject into the exposition of the object of, the sci of science, whether at a cognitive, epistemological, or historical level. Two other epigraphic statements from this philosophical period, one of which sets the stage for our colloquium, are closely related to Spinoza and simultaneously to the same methodological and cognitive problem of integrating the cognitive subject. First, Jacob is saying about building a Spinozism of freedom. As it's well known, Kant paid the recovery of freedom as practical reason at the price of fundamental dualism. The urgency of, Spinoza of, of a Spinozism of freedom thus refers to the requirements of restoring a substantial monism, where the substance takes on the subject's characteristics of which freedom is an essential moment. Okay. On the other hand, Spinoza's monist metaphysics of substance pay the price of a deflationary conception of freedom as free will. The most significant post-Kantian Fichte was thus faced with the question of how to treat freedom as a self-determination self in contrast to freedom as necessity, as proposed by Spinoza's deflationary monism. Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre was the first attempt to solve the problem of a Spinozism of freedom as it tried to integrate the subject as the, the absolute I at the core of the one substance. According to Hegel, however, monism built on the self-position of the I, uh, built 
on the self-position of the eye could not integrate the different spheres or one could say the attributes of substance received from Spinoza, thought and extended nature. The substance defined as a pure self-positing act of the eye is no more productive than Spinoza's substance, defined as causa sui. Uh, the, the task is expressed in Hegel's saying that sets the tone for our conference. In philosophy, everything hangs on grasping and expressing the truth, not just as substance, but just as much as subject. The philosophical text, task of exposing substance also as a subject is an apparent, uh, apparent reference to Spinoza in the Phenomenology of Spirit, a work in which, curiously, Spinoza's name does not occur. Well, I would just uh, point uh, very shortly to the three problems, the insufficiency of Spinoza's philosophical method, but I said already enough about that. Uh, making the subs how uh, Hegel makes the substance productive, um, in, uh, according to a aforementioned proto-romantic interpretation of Spinoza, and three, how to construct a system of pure mediation capable of dispensing with immediate knowledge as a criterion of truth, responding thus to Jacobi's criticism of Spinoza without having to abandon rational mediator. Well, that's just some uh, notes about that which I skipped. Uh, now it's time to stop and thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you. And we, we have 15 minutes for question. Professor Hugge. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm obviously in broad agreement with a lot of what you said. But I do have one minor quibble, I suppose. Um, and it's actually with the relevance of the quotation from Fichte. Um, so, as I, under, I, I accept uh, what you say is Hegel's critique of Spinoza regarding method, and I think speaking personally, I would be broadly in agreement with that. Um, Hegel's method does, in, uh, Spinoza's method does indeed seem to be one of, uh, that begins with certain definitions and then derives uh, ideas uh, from that in what Hegel would regard as a kind of feshtendig way. However, from Spinoza's own point of view, um, he does mention his own philosophy. He does talk about his own procedure of demonstration. Uh, in fact, I'm just looking at a section now in um, uh, the uh, supplementary material, the scol scolium, to Proposition 36 in Part 5, and he refers back to his own demonstration, and the context in which he's putting it makes it very clear that he thinks that the demonstrations of the ethics belong to the second form of knowledge, not the third form and not the first form. So he's well aware of the status of his own thinking, and you could argue that, again, in Spinoza's terms, given the way that he derives, um, as, he puts, as he thinks about it, um, the infinite modes and then the finite modes of thought, and the distinctions he draw, the distinction he draws between inadequate and adequate ideas, that in a sense, within his own terms, he's given a, 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 an explanation of why it is that the ethics takes the form that it does. It takes a form of a series of adequate ideas that are kind of deducible from one another, roughly. Um, so maybe I'm playing devil's advocate on Spinoza's part, but I think it's worth noting. That, that Spinoza is perfectly aware of what he's doing. He does have a conception of his own philosophy. He's able to locate it within his own metaphysics. And so that charge that Spinoza is somehow not self-aware, which seems to be what's coming out of Fichte, I don't think is fair, personally, even though I would agree with other aspects of Hegel's critique that Spinoza's method is ultimately not satisfactory for philosophy. So anyway, I wondered if you'd like to respond to that. Do you think that's fair or, or what I'm saying is wrong? Should I answer? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for bringing some justice to Spinoza, who surely de deserves it. Well, um, uh, of course, uh, there is, if you read um, the treatise on the emendation of the, the understanding, if you... Uh, goes on to the mode of knowledge. Of, of, of course, there is a self-thematizing of how, the, um, how 
to, uh, to know uh, the substance and how to know uh, truth. Truth is the sign of itself. I'd like to speak about that if, if, if in relation to Hegel, if I had the time to, to do that. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, however, the great uh, difference and um, re in reading the treatise on the emendation of the intellect, you find a totally Cartesian uh, position, really a, a typical modern uh, uh, solution for, for, for the, uh, the problem uh, from, um, well, I must say, from a subjective perspective. And the question uh, Hegel's and also Fichte's question later um, is, uh, or Hegel solves the, the problem, I think, uh, uh, positing that kind of problem, I would say, at the level of sub sub subjective spirit, at, at the level of, of the faculty, of y humans' faculties. How do we know something or something? But that is an epistemological question or a gnosiological question, which is not method methodologic methodologically for Hegel it says is not important. It's just a, a secondary question, all gnosiology, all modern gnosiology, how we know uh, what are the kind of, how, what, what is the way uh, we finite uh, human beings know uh, logical categories. Well, that's a, a secondary question. It's not, if since uh, we have through this the phenomenology or through the decision of thinking purely, well, that's that's another problem. But you you are uh, at the objective thoughts. The question of a third, second, or third mode of knowledge is secondary. Who, um, if you would compare it with understanding and reason, well, I would say that there is objectively a treatment of this uh, uh, different ways of. Uh, work with concepts that really make a difference between a subjective way of thinking and objective thought. Then I would answer that, well, um, Spinoza is not totally un unaware, but first, uh, um, he treats the question still at a subjective, uh, gnosiological way, and two, he doesn't say really um, how and why the substance comes to know uh, itself. Or if thought is one of the attributes. Yeah, okay. So that would be another definition. Thought is one of the attributes. And thought necessarily gives rise to the intellect. Yeah, okay. It must okay. know itself. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in any way, the, the, there is not a methodological way of producing uh, the soul from uh, from 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 uh, the absolute, the, the substance. Well, substance has infinite modes, and soul is one of these, uh, uh, thinking is one of these infinite modes. Well, um, okay, that's just a structure objectively pre presented with, with, without a, a kind of proof uh, that Hegel's speculative searches. Of course, uh, I must agree, I must confess that in some way I, I stereotypize, and Hegel also stereotypes a little bit, and uh, we should proceed uh, in more time and more at length, we should proceed uh, with a less uh, stereotypized way, with a less uh, construction, constructing figures uh, that could be more, uh, with more flexible treat treatment. So you are uh, in part right, I would say. <laughs> So, Gregor Mode. Thanks. Um, thank you. Yes, this was uh, wonderful. I, I think my question is a little more clarification question simply because you were very fast because of the time constraints. I'm not sure I completely understood you. But I wanted to first uh, respond also to uh, this discussion right now with, uh, with Stephen. Um, I think the problem for Hegel is even worse than that. Um, of course, Spinoza is aware of his own methods and of his own uh, philosophy. But I think the problem for Hegel is that 
in a way, the method you use already re reveals the weakness of your thought itself. In a sense, Hegel already assumes the idea that, you know, in a proper philosophy, there is no difference between truth and method. You basically, if you treat your, uh, your, your mathematical method as mere method, well, that's precisely your mistake. Uh, but I think maybe there's another uh, way to defend Spinoza, uh, and this is the question I put to you. There's a short text written by Warren Montag on Spinoza and Althusser, a, a very old text, but I think he defends there a position where he tries to align Spinoza closer to Marx, basically. And he argues in favor of, uh, I think the title goes something like Spinoza and Althusser against hermeneutics. That's it, right? Uh, so, and he argues for against uh, interpretation and in favor of intervention. Uh, so I, I suppose that's, you know, he doesn't say Marx, but I think that's what he means. Um, I don't know, do you, do you have a response? Well, um, I, I, I really couldn't uh, thoroughly uh, speak about that point uh, in so far as intervention, well, it's difficult to, to find. A, I, I don't know the text you, you refer to. Um, it's not easy to find this uh, uh, bridge be between Spinoza's concept of freedom and Hegel and then Marx's concept of, uh, or Hegel's concept of freedom and Marx's concept of uh, action. It's, uh, well, it's, that's, um, this confrontation must, must sh surely be very uh, rich, but I don't see a way to, to find what I, I take to be a, in the ethics, uh, the flesh and hairy concept, uh, an individualistic and ethical, individualist ethical concept of freedom, of finding, uh, of finding peace in a way of Epicurean way almost, or, or stoic and, uh, or stoic way. And, and uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, the history and action in history as you think, as you find in Marx. Well, but I'd like to hear more about that. Okay. So I'm very sorry, but we have to close the discussion. I know there are other questions. And thank you again. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Bojana uh, Jovicevic. There she has very recently received her <laughs> PhD uh, on a with a thesis on Hegel notion of free release at the Department uh, of Philosophy here at the University of Ljubljana. And she has been a day day fellow uh, at the University of Leipzig. And uh, her main research interests are Ger uh, classical German idealism, especially Hegel, Fichte, and Kant, metaphysics, logic, and ethics. And she also works as a translator on uh, yeah, some of Jacobi's texts. And uh, today her, top, uh, her talk will be about on the idea of an intuitive knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanna. Uh, first of all, I would like, uh, like to thank you um, uh, to all for making this conference possible. So, um, in this talk, I seek to clarify the role of, of intuitive knowledge for rational finite beings who are perfect in this respect, that they possess rational cognition. What are the reasons, if any, for which our rational cognition needs correction or even subordination to the intuitive? Or can these two be seen as distinct and yet complementary kinds of knowledge? To tackle these questions, I will proceed as follows. By relying on Spinoza's remarks on the subject taken from the ethics mostly from the second, fourth, and fifth part, I will sketch the idea of intuitive knowledge 
and delineate its logical character in relation to two other kinds of knowledge, that of the imagination and that of rational cognition. In the last part, I will, I will briefly turn to Hegel's tripartite framework of knowledge from the phenomenology of spirit to see where exactly Spinoza and he Hegel come together here. Now, my strategy is to try to unfold imminently what follows from Spinoza's own descriptions of his tripartite theory of cognition. So in this sense, I will not expand the topic on his other works or import some other aspects of his thought in order to clarify the problem. Although these are, of course, all legitimate ways to approach it and widely acknowledged by Spinoza's scholars. But you see, I'm no Spinoza scholar, yet I have genuine interest in the topic, and I hope this might give me a chance as well. So please bear with me. Okay, Spinoza's theory of cognition. In the second part of the ethics, in the second scholium to Proposition 40, Spinoza describes three different kinds of knowledge, or to put it more accurately, three distinct thought procedures differing in their origins and sources for how ideas, notion, or we could say concepts can be formed. These are called respectively imagination or opinion, rational cognition, and intuitive knowledge. The first one. In thinking something, we use certain notions, notions of something about which, using these notions, we think. For example, we deploy notion green. Such a notion has a specific content. According to the first kind of knowledge, we acquire the content of this notion by virtue of sharing a sensory nexus with the external objects that supplies us with the knowledge of that very content, such as being grass. In other words, by thinking the notion green through a material relation with the object being grass, which alone provides a specific content for that notion, we distinguish the content of one notion from all the other notions. Green is not red. And one object from another object. What is green in being green differs from what is not green. Notions we form in this way are essentially distinct, individual representations of different objects and mutually exclusive between each other. Because the source of knowledge we gain in such a way is external to the representations we form on the account of such knowledge, it is of course liable to errors, illusions, and shot through with blind spots and impurities. And si since it is a dynamic process, external objects do not just suddenly stop affecting our senses. It cannot be adequately systematized in the sense that it cannot be put in proper order for the intellect, to say it with Spinoza. For to speak of an order for the intellect, one has to speak of at least some common marks shared among the objects, a requirement that knowledge derives solely from distinct particular objects cannot fulfill. This kind of knowledge represented to us through the senses in a way that is, I quote, mutilated, confused, and without order for the intellect is what is called opinion or imagination. Now, it would be unfair to say that imaginatio does not play any positive role in Spinoza's theory of cognition. This is just a footnote. Uh, or that it is only blurred inadequate knowledge. If inadequate knowledge is defined as the form of lack of true and adequate knowledge by means of privation, as Spinoza explicitly puts it, by having an inadequate idea, or indeed by connecting our perceptions in a weird way, given our brain's dispositions, to use Spinoza's term, then 
we thereby confirming to the principle of the confirmed to the principle of the true and adequate knowledge itself, since lack is explained by the same logical principle whose privation it is, it cannot be logically alien to that very principle. In this sense, imaginatio paves up the way for rational knowledge. Sorry. Such an idea of knowledge ma manifests deficiency with respect to the idea of adequate knowledge, namely the idea that knowledge provides ground of its own understanding of itself, that it is intrinsically denominated, to put it with Spinoza. Quote, finally, as to the last, how a man can know that he has an idea that agrees with its object? I have just shown more than sufficiently that this arises solely from him, his having an idea that does agree with its object, or that truth is its own standard, in a beautiful formulation. Such knowledge through which we perceive things truly as they are in themselves, and therefore not exter externally and thus contingently, but as necessary, is called rational cognition. By means of rational cognition, we, we develop notions by abstracting from specific contents of particular objects. We, we isolate some elements, such as processes, states, properties, or laws, depending on the context that the objects have in common. This procedure allows us to grasp objects not only as recollections of different properties placed next to one another, but as self-subsisting holes, qua holes. In this way, we articulate common notions or universals of the objects that are, I quote Spinoza, equally in the part and in the whole, end of the quote. Let us revisit the notion of green. By observing different objects that are being green, we compare them to identify their common properties. In doing so, we separate those that have such properties from those that do not, and we acquire the notion green. We progress from this specific notion to a mere, more general one by gradually peeling off its content or refining it. In doing so, we abstract a certain property contained within the former. Through this process, notions acquire distinct contents and become dif differentiated from one another. Abstraction moves from one content to the other. This knowledge is systematic. It can be or organized or put in order for the intellect into a series of notions of ascending generality. It is true and adequate. Rational cognition provides us with common properties of particular objects and thinking through them, we are elevated to the process of knowledge as infallible, general, and inferential process that makes foundations of our reasoning. End of Spinoza's quote, um, foundations of our reasoning. In this sense, insofar as we are rational beings, such a form of knowledge is a necessary form of discursivity of our intellect as such and thus of any science of thought. But although it does allow for content, notions formed in such a way are not content free, but their content is pure, pure because it does not reflect any particular content of this or that object, but a common notion according to which this or that object is to be taught. It is a purely formal science complied of abstraction, abstractions, pardon me, with Spinoza, what is common to all things and is equally in the part and in the whole does not constitute the essence of any singular thing. End of the quote. So, as opposed intuitive knowledge, as opposed to the cognition of abstractions through scientia intuitiva, knowledge of singular things, 
or the third kind of knowledge, terms are used mostly interchangeably, we grasp an object by virtue of its singular essence or its inner principle. That's what makes an object what it is. As Spinoza puts it, this kind of knowledge proceeds from an adequate, adequate idea of the formal essence of certain attributes of God to the adequate knowledge of the formal essence of things. While in the second kind of knowledge, we proceed from co the cognition of formal essence of certain attributes of God, for example, if we cognize extension, therein we perceive general laws of motion or matter as given in space. The third kind of knowledge somehow enables us to localize such general laws in particular things. To illustrate this kind of knowledge, Spinoza provides, us, uh, provides a mathematical example of how to do, use a fourth proportional to the numbers one, two, and three. We could adopt a basic strategy used by the Merkins. Multiply the second and the third number and then divide by the first. Alternatively, we could go with it in a more gebilded manner um, and infer the number from a common property of proportionality. However, as Spinoza further explains, in the simplest numbers, none of this is necessary. We can infer the result from the ratio between the numbers, and even so, in one glance, and therein, so it seems, the single, a singular essence of a number. Not much is said here. In mathematics, intuitive knowledge might arise or manifest itself, this we know, but this does not tell us what it is or where it comes from, so we must press further. An essence, essence of a singular thing cannot be gra grasped from imaginatio because only a form of adequate knowledge can give rise to it. It cannot be grasped with the means of purely rational cognitive either, as with this we move from singular objects to their general properties. And finally, it cannot be taught as part of an infinite intellect, as if two, as if two uh, though the two were strictly splitted. The only point, pardon, from which to cognize an essence of a singular thing is then ourselves. We turn to ourselves, to our own particular nature. In fact, if we take that human nature, the nature of the human being is ratio, intellect, thought, that's what makes it what it is, then a human being has an inner principle or essence which is not opposed to her particular nature, but is this very nature itself. There is no singular thing in nature that is more useful to man than a man, I quote, who lives in according to the guidance of reason. So it follows from the very essence of human being that in order to express her nature adequately, she has to live in accordance with reason. In such a way, uh, she acquires, uh, I quote, an adequate knowledge of God's eternal and infinite essence. If, however, this were the sole aspect of the issue, scientia intuitiva would not distinguish itself from any type of self-knowledge towards which each rational finite being individually strives to. But this is not the crux of the problem. The question is not how an, how an isolated human being gets access introspectively, introspectively to her essence as if it were something separate from her own nature, but how reason, that is her own nature, and thus the nature of all, manifests itself by virtue of instantiation in each and every one of us. I quote, therefore among singular things, there is nothing more useful to man than a man." End of the quote. Thus, to truly live in accordance with reason is to live in congruence with one's own nature and thus with other men. So a rational, finite being 
acting in accordance with her own nature is her relation to every other rational finite being acting in accordance with her own nature. Their relation is this. They know each other to be particular individuals. This knowledge is practical, that is, it is activity, and it is a relation, that is, they who are so related act one toward the other. This knowledge, this activity, this relation that rational finite being is, is ethical. It is of what to do and how to act. Through it, blessedness, freedom, love, and the greatest joy, that of God, arise. The science that articulates this is the scienti intuitiva, or science of reason. One could object that the idea of intuitive knowledge is indeed congruent with the idea of reason, but its mode of expression is not essence. But as long as such knowledge is the expression of human nature by virtue of which she is who she is, it takes the form of her inner principle or essence. But this essence is not anthropomorphic, transcendent, or infinite. It is dispersed through various relationships and interactions in nature among singular individual entities and where men work with men. Now, in the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel introduces a tripartite structure of knowledge, respectively called Vorstellung, Verstand und Vernunft, to describe the science of thinking or philosophy. In short, Vorstellung refers to representations, imago, being equated with the form of unmediated knowledge. Verstand stands for understanding the knowledge of abstractions. It deals with its own logical form and by virtue of which no direct access to cognition of singular things is possible. Vernunft reason, on the other hand, seems to have it both. Through it, we cognize things as being taught and in doing so, as being what they truly and really are. While the transition from the first to the second one in Hegel's scenario happens violently, it is the tearing of the immediacy. And this sense, in this sense, takes a clear conceptual cut and activity of the subject. With Spinoza, this move is different. One could say even the opposite. With imaginatio, a moment of receptivity or passivity is involved, since it is the object and not the subject that appears to be the source of knowledge that informs her on the representations she forms upon them. Now much more can be said about the connection between the two, but I won't go into that. The move I find legitimate though is to offer one example by which a sparkle of scientia intuitiva, the way I understand it, of Spinoza's thought can be found in phenomenology and by virtue of which these similarities and differences carry some conceptual weight. I think it is the idea of universal work, das allgemeine Werk. It refers to the formation of the notion of the common, starting from individual in her particularity. In acting so as to realize her, realize her own interests and thus with what is useful for her, she acts in such a way that the interests of others could be realized as well. The work of each and every one of us becomes the work of all. That work being the work of reason, of thinking, or the concrete universal. I will stop here now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anton Kaleski. Uh, thank you, Bayana, for a very interesting talk. Um, so a question about Spinoza's uh, second kind of knowledge in, in your um, discussion. Uh, so I think, um, again, I'm, I, here I'm also not a Spinoza scholar, so I don't have the, all the passages uh, on my fingertips, but I think there, are di there is a difference in Spinoza between 
sort of two kinds of uh, general concepts, right? One is universals, which is actually kind of conf confused knowledge in the end of the day, right? Uh, um, for example, numbers he sometimes uh, characterizes in that kind of way, or the species concepts, which uh, were, you know, he says that, yeah, we, when we judge nature as being at, uh, as faulty somehow, right? So we, we make some abstractions which are actually like, not uh, adequate in any way. Mm -hmm. Right, and on the other hand, there are yeah the, those common notions which are the same in the whole and in the part, as you say. Mm -hmm. But then you give examples of colors, for example, and I'm not sure where colors fall in this. Uh, my sense is actually that they are more on the f first, so not not the adequate concepts, yeah. because uh, in colors uh, he has some kind of his own version of primary secondary qualities distinction, right? There were so there are some perceptions where our own sort of cognitive apparatus contributes m uh, to wh what we uh, perceive, right? So, and that's, I think, is true for colors. So, yeah, I don't think that colors are, will be what uh, <laughs> is uh, yeah. bo both in the whole and in the parts, right? That will be more like mechanistic properties. Mm -hmm. Like his own yeah. examples are, I think, motion and rest and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, uh, you are right, maybe the example of the color was not the most fitting one. Yeah, but I just wanted to purport this idea of abstraction and the second uh, kind of knowledge being science of abstraction. So, but yes, thank you. Um, yeah, some other example would be more appropriate. Or just as a follow up, yeah, but I think it, it also shows that it's not maybe straightforward to just any kind of abstraction, right? Because yeah, colors we sort of learn by some kind of, well, I guess we acquire the color concepts by some sort of abstraction. Yeah. But I guess it's not enough maybe to, to get the adequate concepts, right? Because uh, yeah, if, if that sort of, if, if that abstraction leads to inadequate concepts, then it's, then you need something else to sort of, to arrive at those, in my sense. Uh, hmm. Okay, I'm not sure how to respond to this, um, but um, yes, I mean, the idea was that we can observe the second kind of knowledge as a specific procedure of forming notions where contents of these notions are not empty, but they are abstract, therefore green. Maybe it was not the best choice, but this was like the, the reasoning behind it, yeah, and thank you. There are still three more questions. Maybe we try to keep it short, Stephen, would be it? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a brief follow-up on that one. I personally would get rid of the idea of abstraction. Common notions are not abstractions. Mm -hmm. They're concrete universals. They're, they're the com commonalities you say you see in the part and, and this leads into, I guess, my question. Um, do you think that intuitive knowledge is the knowing, a kind of knowing that we can't have at any other level? It's the knowing, let's put it differently, the knowing of that which we can't know at any level. Or do you think, as I think, <laughs> that intuitive knowledge is just ras rational knowledge at one glance? Now that is suggested by the very example of the merchants, that clearly you can work out the ratios that would give you the fourth number, or you can see it at one glance. Now, formal essences of singular things can also be understood through reason if you think of adequate ideas as based on common notions that are not abstractions, but that discern the laws of motion and rest in the particular, in the singular then if that's the case, then we can have adequate rational knowledge of the essence of singular things. You, you understand the processes through which something is caused to be, and it comes to be with its properties and with its singularity. Now, if that's right, then intuitive knowledge is just rational knowledge in an immediate form. But I don't know if that's what you think. I suspect you think it's the knowledge of something different. And it's quite important, and it's what it bears on Jacobi, because it's whether, is, in, is immediate knowledge just another way of knowing mediated knowledge immediately? Or is it a different kind of knowledge that knows something different? Uh, 
Um, I think it's a different kind of knowledge that knows something different, and it's a form of practical knowledge in comparison to theoretical. So, yes, it, um, its effects are able to retroactively change the cause. So, um, yeah, it's not. Um, it's something we can't know through reason. Uh, no, uh, it is something that we can know through reason, but uh, this reason has to have a sort of practical, uh, has to realize itself practically in the form of social and ethical like life. At least if we read this idea of intuitive knowledge with the fourth and fifth part. So it's not an opposition to reason, it's the continuation of reason with another means. Practical, yeah, thanks. Um, it's more of a remark rather than a question, but just one thing. I mean, of course, for Spinoza, it's obvious that living according to reason is, you know, the most important thing and so on. It's also famous, uh, his remark, that nothing is more useful to men than men. But I don't agree that reason is the essence of men. He's quite explicit on that. Mm -hmm. In the uh, scolium to ninth preposition of the third part of the ethics, the famous scolium where he talks about Conatus, one of the central contact, uh, concepts, he clearly says that conatus can be, you know, if it relates only to the mind, is voluntas. If it relates to mind and body, it's appetitus. And if you are conscious, there is a bit of consciousness also in Spinoza, I would say, si homines consci sunt of appetitus, that's called cupiditas, and this is the essence of man. It's very, I mean, explicitly he says that. So maybe how would you fit that into your interpretation. Okay, um, yeah, thank you for the remark. Maybe by essence I thought more of a inner principle of singularity of that what makes a particular entity or a particular human being of that what it is. So, yeah, and Next question, Luca Letrati. Okay. Thank you so much, Boyana. It's okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I have a curiosity, so to say, or uh, I wanted to ask you if the difference uh, um, that Hegel institutes uh, at the beginning of the difference shrift, where he uh, differentiate Erkenntnis uh, mm -hmm. und Wissen. Mm -hmm. also, uh, gives, gives us the possibility to understand uh, um, a, a sort of graduation of uh, uh, modality of knowing uh, uh, in Spinoza too. Uh, so we can uh, see this differentiation into uh, Spinoza or, or not. Yeah, Luca, thank you for your question. Um, hmm. Maybe with a transition from the second to third kind of knowledge, uh, or what we know, n know is not also known. It has to be known. Uh, but I connect this then that this knowledge has to be practical. But yes, thank you for your question. Thank yeah. you. There's another question. I, I can't see. <laughs> Um, one, one thing only, uh, the, about the colors, uh, no? Uh, no, no, because the example of color uh, is right, uh, um, in my opinion, because, for example, in the Tractatus uh, de Intellectus Emendazione, uh, Spinoza speaks about uh, the third kind of knowledge with the expression um, uno intuito videre. Videre, he uh, uses uh, the, the verb of perception, no? And in this case, and, and also he speaks about like in a picture, no? In, is, uh, only, only for this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Actually, we have still a few minutes. <laughs> You hear me? Yeah. Um, I hope I will not make a, a bad name of being anti-natural guy here, but 
again a question on because I just made a comment on uh, nature also uh, in your paper. Well, um, just a question: if you if you just uh, equate reason like being harmonious with nature, uh, maybe I, if I misunderstood you, you can of, co of course correct me. But I would I wouldn't be uh, be unjust to at least Hegel because like. There's a paradox of being natural for Hegel, I would say, which is we human beings are natural because we, we can break with nature, and that is the point which makes us natural. But as far as I could uh, hear you, the, um, the way how you, how you attribute also a kind of reason in Spinoza, I think it will also be a bit like a, um, an easy reading of Spinoza just if we just read him a kind of uh, a thinker who just like uh, equates being natural with with uh, with with reason, and is it, is this the way how you like do you attribute Spinoza a kind of equation like kind of dissolving reason in nature, and put you against? Hegel, or did I misunderstood that? You know, I mean, it, it's not about reason being expressed in nature, as I've said. It's uh, about um, how to, um, yes, perfect our reason, live in accordance uh, with our reason, but through our singular, uh, through 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 who we are, including our singularities and particular interests and um, desires and inclinations um, and um, we have and it's not uh, you know it's not already there it's not to be given it's a task in uh, this is why the example with the universal work i find appropriate because it's actualization of one's own interest that at the same uh, time allows production for the very condi conditions that will allow also others to actualize their own interests. So this is a work. It's not, um, you know, anticipation of equality uh, in relation to reason and nature, but it's something we have to gain through by um, standing together. Yes. Okay, so thank you, Vajana. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, Anton Kabetsky. Anton earned his PhD in uh, 2019 at John Knox University. And uh, his dissertation was on Hegel's philosophy in nature and now is uh, working as research as assistant at University of Potsdam. Today's presentation is Hegel and Spinoza on determinacy and negation. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you. And thanks for organizing this conference. I would like to thank the organizers. <coughs> it's really wonderful. Um, so my, my talk focuses on the remark in the second edition of The Logic of Being um, at the beginning of the second chapter, Das Dasein. Uh, where Hegel attacks the concept of God as omnitudo realitatis or inbegriff ala realitatem. Uh, in the same remark, he affirms the importance of Spinoza's dictum deter determinatio negatio est and provides some critical discussion of Spinoza's metaphysics. Uh, in the first edition, it's, uh, uh, actually these topics are split into separate remarks. <clears throat> Uh, these are all aspects of Hegel's attack on the view, uh, or in, as a, in, in my view, uh, it's all aspects of Hegel's attack of the view that reality is both ontological and conceptually prior to negation, the view that a multitude of philosophers from at least Parmenides onwards have held to be obviously correct and that comes in a variety of, of forms. Uh, Hegel's critique of this family of views can be seen as an important threat throughout the logic of being and to some extent the logic uh, his logic in general. Uh, thus, for example, in the first chapter of this um, of the logic of being uh, and design, uh, Hegel attacks the simplest version of this view to the effect that the fundamental reality that does not involve any limitation or negation is something simple and undifferentiated. Basically, the Parmenidian view. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the second chapter, does Dasein, uh, in the remark mentioned, the target of his attack is the view that the fundamental reality, or God, does not involve any limitation or negation, and yet has or is constituted by multiple predicates or attributes. Uh, this view was quite widespread among early modern philosophers um, up until to and including Kant, who developed two versions of this view. Uh, the metaphysical one in the only possible argument and the critical version of it in the chapter on the transcendental ideal of the critique of pure reason. Now on the standard, on the relatively standard so-called objectivist reading of Spinoza's attributes, this is also Spinoza's view. And in this paper I will try to outline the dialectical situation between Spinoza and as well as other representatives of this view of God as uh, omnitude realitatis on the one hand and Hegel on the other hand on this particular issue. I start with looking at Hegel's objection to this view in the remark mentioned above. Then I will consider Spinoza's possible response to this objection, which might actually clarify um, some obscurity in his uh, definition of the attribute. And finally, I will point out where Hegelian reasons for nevertheless rejecting the Spinoza's position in spite of this possible response might lie. Okay, the first part, uh, the, remar uh, the remarks, so the somewhat closer reading of this remark now. Um, so Hegel's argument in the section before the remark it was supposed to establish the determinacy as such or bestimmtheit, uh, which at this, time, at this point he names quality uh, has two aspects to it, namely reality and negation. Uh, so the ontological implication of this point could be understood the, in such a way that for anything to be, de uh, uh, for anything determinate, it is essential both that it is something in its own right and that it negates or excludes other things. This negation is constitutive um, of its determinacy just as much as, as its reality is, so there is no priority of reality over, over this negation. <clears throat> um, at the end of that section, just before the remark, uh, Hegel points out that when one considers determinate being or Dasein as reality, its negative aspect is concealed, which can lead one to consider reality as something merely positive, uh, from which negation, uh, uh, quote, from which negation of your nine and boundedness, lack, are excluded, uh, unquote. <clears throat> So as I have in, just indicated in, in the introduction, I believe that this sort of prioritization of reality over negation is a mistake that Hegel deals with throughout at least the logic of being in its various forms, uh, from the initial transitions from the pure being to nothing and to becoming, to the discussion of the absolute indifference at the end of the book. Uh, the significance of this mistake is r related to the fact that so many significant philosophers have made it and it is no wonder that at this point Hegel devotes a lengthy remark largely to the comments on this topic. <clears throat> uh, in the remark, after some comments on various senses of the word reality, Hegel turns to the concept of God as uh, uh, in begriff aller realitäten, or sum total of all reality. <clears throat> as he points out, this concept is related to the ontological proof of God's existence um, although at this point he actually only so outlines the preliminary step of this argument that Leibniz specifically supplied, namely the proof that the concept of God is not uh, contradictory since it contains only purely positive predicates that contain no negation, and so the conjunction of such predicates cannot contain a contradiction. Now Hegel's problem here is not so much with this reasoning that, uh, yeah, the conjunction of realities which don't include negation involves no contradiction, but with the underlying concept of a purely positive reality that does not contain any negation or limitation. <clears throat> As we have seen, he takes himself to have already established in the main text before the remark that any determinate being contains negation as its aspect. Uh, because of this, a purely positive predicate would be nothing determinate and thus would in fact coincide with the first category that Hegel considers in the logic, or the indeterminate pure being. And now a somewhat lengthier quote on this point. 
Meryl says, uh, bei diesem Begriff der Realität wird angenommen, dass sie dann noch bleibe, wenn alle Negationen weggedacht werden. Damit wird all, aber alle Bestimmtheit derselben aufgehoben. Die Realität ist Quali Qualität da sein. Damit enthält sie das Moment des, des Negativen und ist allein dadurch das Bestimmte, das sie ist. Im sogenannten eminenten Sinne oder als unendliche in der gewöhnlichen Bedeutung des Wortes, wie sie genommen werden soll, äh, wird sie in, in die Bestimmungslose erweitert und verliert ihre Bedeutung. Okay, so this indeterminateness and the resulting meaninglessness of positive predicates implies that the concept of God as the sum total of all realities is itself something indeterminate and empty, and thus also collapses back into this Parmenidian concept of undifferentiated being. As Hegel expresses it, God als das rein reale in allem realen oder als inbegriff aller Realitäten ist dasselbe Bestimmungs- und Gehaltlose, was das Lehre absolute in dem alles eins ist. <clears throat> Now, of course, the philosophers who adopted this concept have meant it so that God has multiple different predicates, uh, each of which expresses only reality and no negation. Indeed, in the case of Spinoza, um, on the standard reading of what infinity of attributes means, God has infinitely many attributes, um, You know, there is an alternative view that infinite uh, here means only all, so it's compatible with there being just two. But uh, on the standard reading yeah, for Spinoza, there are infinitely many uh, attributes, each of which uh, is uh, purely positive, so that doesn't contain, contain negation. <clears throat> so Hegel's point here must be that such philosophers are not entitled to assuming that there could be multiple different uh, purely positive predicates because for them to be distinct from each other, their natures would have to involve negation of each other. <clears throat> If, however, each supposedly purely positive predicate is completely indeterminate, then they cannot differ from each other, and so God cannot have multiple purely positive predicates. It's a kind of summary of his argument in this, in this remark against this view as, as of, go, of God as a in the Greek for other realitäten. And now if we consider Spinoza as a representative of this view, which is possible uh, under the so-called objective interpretation of his attributes according to which attributes are real re and really distinct from each other. Um, so on this view, uh, we can see uh, that Uh, in Spinoza's text, there are actually, th this problem sort of manifests in a couple of places. Um, so one place uh, where we can see maybe a problem uh, with Spinoza's view that there are uh, multiple uh, such a attributes is at the very beginning of part two of the ethics where he uh, tries to prove that uh, there are that thought and extension are attributes of God. Uh, so he provides a, a proof, um, so I don't have quotes here, but basically the, the argument is that um, uh, for thought, the, mo the modes of thought are, uh, because their modes must be conceived through God, and then by reference to uh, the definition of modes, uh, um, uh, he uh, concludes that they have to be uh, con uh, conceived under some attribute of God, which, okay, is, I guess, fine for, for us here. And then he says, okay, I, I named this, uh, th this attribute extension, which is also fine. And then he says, well, the same goes for the, the next, uh, for, the attribute, uh, uh, for the attribute of extension, so that was for thought. The same goes for uh, extension. But the thing is that the problem is that he doesn't prove that these are, they are distinct from each other, in fact. Yeah, so the, the arguments that, yeah, the modes of thought can be conceived through some attribute of God and the, go the, the modes of extension can be conceived through some attribute uh, of God uh, must be supplemented by a proof that these attributes are actually also distinct in order to, uh, at this point, to show that, yeah, there are two distinct attributes of God. <laughs> so we see that, yeah, actually Spinoza doesn't really prove uh, that, pr uh, prove that there are two different attributes of God. <laughs> Another 
point where we can see sort of this problem with the plurality, well, in this case, maybe not directly with the plurality of the attributes, but with this notion that they don't involve negation in Spinoza, is actually his uh, definition six of uh, part one of the ethics where Spinoza seems to characterize attributes both as involving no negation and as something of which we can negate infinite attributes, right? <laughs> as uh, actually Isaac Malamed also uh, uh, notes in some places. <laughs> yeah. um, now one can make this consistent by, suggest consistent by suggesting that an attribute does not involve negation only within its own kind, since it is invented in its own kind. For example, uh, the attribute of extension does, does not involve any negations or limitations within extension, which is not to say that one cannot deny thought and other attributes of it. <laughs> But this would mean that attributes do involve negation insofar as they exclude other attributes, and this negation in part makes them the attributes uh, what, that they are. Uh, now Hegel at least entertains this interpret interpretative option, so this reading of Spinoza, later in the same remark uh, when he's discussing uh, Spinoza's formula determination as negation. There he initially suggests that thought and extension, insofar as they are determinate realities, are negations, presumably, of each other and of other attributes. On this reading, um, they would be determinate aspects, or in Hegel's terminology, as he says, they're moments of the one substance. Uh, so it's a possible reading, but Hegel himself quickly abandons this interpretative option and asserts that um, Vielmehr sind sie ihm nicht einmal Momente, uh, denn, denn die Substanz ist das Inner Selbst ganz bestimmungslose und die Attribute sind wie auch die Modi Unterscheidungen, die ein äußerer Verstand macht. Uh, in this quote, um, the reference to the external intellect uh, can be read in two ways. Uh, in, the, uh, in one way, it can be uh, as a reference to Spinoza's definition of the attribute at uh, uh, definition four of part one, to which I will return quickly, and to Hegel's own distinction between the immanent development of the logical, uh, yeah, the second way is, um, uh, is a, as a reference to he Hegel's own distinction between the immanent development of the logical categories out of each other on the one hand, and the merely external reflection upon those categories and their relation on the other. So if we read the reference in the first way, we effectively ascribe the ecosmist interpretation of Spinoza to Hegel. Mm -hmm. uh, the second meaning of this external intellect as this sort of external reflection seems to be operative actually in Hegel's later critique of Spinoza with, uh, towards the end of the logic of essence, where his primary objection seems to be that even though Spinoza does posit attributes and modes of the one substance, he does not develop these further determinations imminently but just posits them. Um, but in any case, this further critique of Spinoza is not particularly relevant to our topic here. Um, and as far as the ecosmist interpretation goes, uh, the aspect of it that is important for us now is not the modi, right? The, whether they are uh, objective in Spinoza uh, or just shine. Uh, but uh, Hegel's argument that if Spinoza conceives of attributes as something that does not have any negation at all, uh, which is like contrary to this interpretative option which he uh, himself entertains but ab abandons. Uh, so uh, Spinoza cannot, canton, cannot ma maintain the plurality of the attributes. <clears throat> and as I have already pointed out, this objection affects many other early modern philosophers uh, as well. Okay, that's the first part, the, uh, Hegel's critique of Spinoza in this remark. Now, Question, could Spinoza and uh, other philosophers who endorsed the concept of God as uh, omnitudo realitatis uh, respond to this objection in some satisfactory way? So this is more of a philosophical part, I guess, less textual, a little bit textual. <coughs> uh, well, one option is to accept the option that, uh, that Hegel entertains in, entertains in this remark, namely to accept the point that um, attributes are indeed partially constituted by negation, but only of all other attributes, uh, and thus are not uh, purely positive after all. So they are uh, infinite in their own kinds. They are not, so uh, for example, the attribute of um, extension 
uh, does not involve any negation within extension, but it does involve negation of other attributes of, uh, of God and so for, or for all other attributes. So as far as Spinoza is concerned, I think there is evidence both for and against this interpretative option. Um, but what I see as a central difficulty for this view is that um, since according to um, definition four of, the, of part one, the attributes constitute God's essence, if the attributes were to involve negation, then so would God, which is, I think, contrary to Spinoza's some very basic positions. Um, Hegel actually still never entertains this idea in the same remar remark, and he is, like, here's a quote. He says, Wir dagegen der Realität in ihrer Bestimmtheit genommen, so wird, da sie wesentlich das Moment des Negativen enthält, der, der Inbegriff aller Realitäten ebenso sehr zu, zu einem Inbegriff aller Negationen, dem Inbegriff aller Widersprüche, zunächst etwa zur absoluten Macht, in der alles Bestimmte absorbiert ist, aber, aber da sie selbst nur ist, insofern sie noch ein von ihr nicht aufgehobenes sich gegenüber hat, so wird sie, indem sie zur ausgef ausgeführten schrankenlosen Macht erweitert gedacht wird, zum abstrakten Nichts. So I think it might, uh, might be some anticipation of some of his considerations in the logic of essence, so this sort of goes also beyond the uh, topic of this paper, <coughs> uh, as well as the thorough assessment of the evidence uh, for and against uh, um, of this interpretation uh, as an interpretation of Spinoza. <coughs> and as far as other early modern philosophers, such as, for example, Leibniz, Wolf, and Kant, uh, they seem to be clearly accepting the doctrine of multiple purely positive predicates. So this option, as far as I see, uh, is not even open to them. <coughs> Okay, so are there any other way to respond to Hegel here? Well, another option might be this. Uh, one can say that there are multiple attributes or predicates um, uh, which express some but not all of reality and that they differ from each other. And here the thought would be this uh, these differences are not constitutive of these attributes. But then one can ask, Okay, so what would be the reason for the attributes difference from each other in this kind of case? And there was, as far as I can see, the only possible answer seems to be that they would have to differ from each other in virtue of their own determinate positive nature alone, or in virtue of what they are in themselves. And this means that the attributes would have their own intrinsic nature on the one hand, and their difference from other attributes on the other, and also the former, so their own intrinsic nature, would one-sidedly determine the latter without being in any way sort of touched by this difference of the attributes from other attributes. <coughs> uh, for example, the attributes of extension and thought would each have their own determinate positive natures, let's say A and B respectively, and A would be different from B, but the, uh, the determinacy of the natures are, uh, a and B would not be dependent on their difference from each other, or on their difference from any other attributes. <coughs> and this difference between extension and thought would then in no way be reflected in their natures, A and B, although it would be something that an intellect that considers that both of them would register. Now, is this a view that Spinoza himself endorsed or could have endorsed? Well, I think it might actually be that his famously strange and contentious definition of the attribute uh, at uh, definition four of uh, part one is actually an, ind an indication, a possible indication of him endorsing this view. So the, the definition says, uh, by attribute I understand what the intellect perceives of a substance as constituting its essence. And the question is why does Spinoza mention the intellect at all in this definition? Right, and, and this is a question on which uh, Spinoza's scholars have been divided okay, uh, for a long time. Those who favor the so-called subjective interpretation of the attributes suggest that Spinoza mentions the intellect because the attributes uh, do not really constitute the essence of the substance, but do so only apparently or for the intellect. Uh, these interpreters can make sense of Spinoza's res reference to the intellect here, but the region faces many other problems, not gonna list them. 
by contrast, the proponents of the objective interpretation of the attributes argue that the attributes are really distinct from each other, and really do constitute the essence of the substance, but they have difficulty explaining why he mentions the intellect in, in this definition. And what I suggest here is that our considerations about the question of whether negation enters into the nature of the attributes can help objectivists to explain this reference. Maybe Spinoza was himself concerned with this issue, and that this is not an anachronistic reading of Hegelian considerations back into Spinoza may be indicated by him seeming vacillation in the definition six of part one. And maybe he at least entertained the response along these lines, the lines proposed above, although maybe not, he didn't fully work, work it out and didn't say it in so many words. So the thought would then be that attributes do indeed constitute the essence of a substance, uh, but only an in external intellect can perceive the difference between these attributes. So they differ, but only, yeah, uh, that is not reflected in their natures, and only external in intellect can register that difference. Um, and, and so also the multi multitude of uh, the attributes. <clears throat> and okay, that's the second part, and the short third part is whether Hegel, whether there are Hegelian arguments against this position. Uh, so there are a couple of places in the logic of being which might seem promising. One is Hegel's discussion of determination or Bestimmung, which stands for the intrinsic nature of something or etwas, and constitution or Beschaffenheit, uh, uh, which stands for the side with which it is open to other things. Hegel argues that although these aspects of something are indeed different from each other and they initially seem to be indifferent or gleichgültig like towards each other, a closer look shows that they are not, rather insofar as, the, as that which something is in itself is also added, it is afflicted with being for other. The, term, the, the determination as such is thus open to uh, the relation to another. <coughs> Um, now, the case with attributes whose intrinsic nature does not involve its difference from other attributes seems to exactly fit this kind of case, right? It's uh, sort of its uh, intrinsic nature is uh, initially seemed to be indifferent to their uh, relation to other, other attributes. So if Hegel's argument against this position uh, is successful, then it's also uh, telling against the Spinozist position that I here construct here, constructed here. Then there is a similar place, I just mentioned it, uh, where Hegel talks about Anzig Sein and Sein für Anderes, which are sort of previous versions of this Bestimmung, Beschaffenheit uh, pair. Also, kind of, I have very similar remarks on this. And the third place is uh, his transition from the initial disc uh, discussion of something and other, or etwas und ein anderes. Uh, uh, just a bit. <coughs> initially, there is a full symmetry between the something and the other. In that, some, in that both are something and both are other with respect to another. Uh, and so the designation of either something as other is arbitrary in this way, uh, and so it's some, something external to it. Um, again, this is the position uh, which is similar, seems similar to the, to the situation with attributes if they're excluding of each other, negating each other, does not enter into their constitution, then calling them sort of different from other attributes is something, it's just an extrinsic denomination of them, something that is sort of not intrinsic to them. Again, Hegel has some reasons to make a transition from that to the next position where uh, to, this, to the discussion of the other of itself and not just the other of the other something. Um, so I, the problems with all these transitions uh, in Hegel, I do, like basically I don't think that any of the transitions would constitute something like a knockdown argument for a Spinozist without also looking at the whole way as how Hegel even arrives to this constitution of something as something, because by the time he arrives at something, he already has this view that something is, uh, uh, includes negation in the structure. That some, that as a, if he just starts from here, yeah, Spinoza of course would not buy it or any other philosopher like that. So a proper way to argue here against the Spinozist would be to start with the beginning of the logic and reconstruct the whole line of thought. Mm -hmm. But just to close, uh, I think there is also a bit of a less sort of intrinsic, uh, 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 another argument, uh, maybe a bit ad hominem argument against Spinoza here, uh, or against also Leibniz and Wolf, for example, 
uh, philosophers who all, all accepted the principle of sufficient reason in a strong form, the response had to, uh, uh, so the, the, that response, uh, Spinozist response, which I considered in the second part, uh, had to assume both the existence of determinacy as such and the determinacy of each of the attributes as something that is not further explicable, just as a brute fact. And any adherent of you know, the principle of sufficient reason should not be content with accepting brute facts, and especially so many brute facts, for, uh, in Spinoza's case, an infinity of brute facts for each attribute. So, and on the other hand, Hegel has an account of determinacy, in general, of what, how deter what explains for the existence of determinacy, right? In, ter in terms of a structure that invo it involves both negation and reality. And he would also have a, an account of uh, any specific difference in terms of exclusion of other, th of other things. So there, in this way, I think he also has an uh, ad hominem argument against uh, philosophers who both accept the omnitude realitatis doctrine and the pr principle of sufficient reason. Thank you. <clears throat>
it's so it's not primitive it's not unconceived it's not unexplainable it is self explainable mm -hmm. now of course you can and should keep on pressing him um, or I, I will press him and say well what's precisely how do you spell out the difference between mm -hmm. primitive and self explanatory and i think there is a good question here i'm not sure actually that either side as a is is going to win on on this issue uh, the second point is with we, when you ask you know when you press this question about uh, what distinguish two attributes from each other i think that um, spinoza is definitely going to say uh, it must be self uh, attributes must be self explanatory self explanatory identity non identity all must be built into the concept of this specific attribute now, if Spinoza is also able to work out, and I think he does, able to work out the proof that each attribute is, have nothing in common with the other. Mm -hmm. So it seems that once you have something as, uh, as being designated as an attribute, I mean, it cannot, nothing about it can be explained by an appeal to something else. All this being said, I think you can still and should write press uh, Spinoza on the beginning of part two, right? And so the argument is saying, now, how does your proof of the second attribute, the first attribute is always easy, how does your proof of the second attribute is going to, to, um, to work? I mean, I think it's, it's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I took it from you initially, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I I mean, yeah, uh, so as far as self-explanatory, um, uh, attributes being self-explanatory, well, yeah, he would say that. But here, the idea is that, um, well, if he, I guess also there, uh, it's, it's not just that, the, well, like, is everything about uh, attributes sort of self-explanatory then? Is there, I mean, the question here is specifically about the determinacy, like being not just some attribute, but this determinate attribute. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess my question would be like, okay, how what exactly does it mean that, uh, for example, an attribute of extension is self-explanatory, right, as opposed to just it just being a brute fact that it has this specificity of being an attribute of extension. Uh, I mean, yeah, just uh, I guess I would just. As, as you sort of suggest, also would try to pr push it, push it, push it further, maybe spell it out a little bit. Uh, yeah, the second point. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think the the, the argument that uh, attributes do not have anything in common with each other it comes kind of later, right? That, uh, and I, what I'm concerned with here is sort of the initial assumptions. So if we can put pressure on the very on the assumptions, sort of at the level of like definitions. Uh, then it's not clear that he can build uh, this argument about them having nothing in common on that foundation if the foundation itself is problematic. And that's sort of the idea here. Mm -hmm. There are no other questions. Thank you. <laughs>
a professor uh, Hulgate um, is professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick. Among his publications, I can here um, uh, recall he Hegel, Nietzsche, and uh, the criticism of metaphysics, the opening on Hegel's logic, and his last two volumes, Hegel on being. He served as vice president and president of the Hegel Society of uh, America. And uh, he was editor of the bulletin of the Hegel Society of Great Britain, and now is currently president of the society. And today's talk is entitled Hegel's Critic of Spinoza. Thank you, Professor. Good, thank you. Um, and um, thanks to all of you for being here. It's been a, a long but very interesting day, so um, I... Uh, hope that you still have the energy for a little bit more uh, Hegel and Spinoza. Um, I'd also thank, like to thank the... Oh, I'm not going to do that. Sorry, it's going to have to go like that because I'm going to bump into it. Okay, I'll speak, I'll speak loud. Um, so I'd really like to thank the organizers. Uh, I know that it's a tremendous amount of work organizing these things. And all I can say is that from the perspective of those of us participating, um, it's been a great success, and there's a real sense of, uh, of uh, working together, so I'd like to uh, express uh, my gratitude to you uh, for that. Um, okay, are we happy with this? Okay. Right. I don't get on with microphones very well. Um, Hegel has long been criticized for misunderstanding Spinoza. Indeed, he's been charged by Pierre Macheret with systematically misrepresenting Spinoza's thought so that he could integrate it into his own system. This charge, however, is misplaced. Hegel misunderstands Spinoza in many ways, but his aim is not to assimilate Spinoza's ideas into a totalizing dialectic. His aim is rather, rather to interpret Spinoza's thought through the concepts he takes to underlie it, namely the absolute and substance as they are conceived in his logic. Yet Hegel's account of these concepts shows that Spinoza fails to understand either one adequately. In my view, this problem remains even when we correct the errors in Hegel's reading of Spinoza. Even in this case, from the standpoint of Hegel's logic, Spinoza fails to understand fully what substance, attributes, and modes are. Hegel praises many aspects of Spinoza's thought in particular, he states, the greatness of such thought is to renounce everything determinate, particular, and to relate only to the one. For this renunciation is the beginning of all philosophy. Yet Spinoza's substance for Hegel is not only the abyss into which everything only disappears, but it is also causa sui. In this respect, Hegel maintains, such substance is a fundamental concept in everything speculative. Hegel, however, also criticizes Spinoza. Despite being causa sui, he complains, Spinoza's substance does not develop, but remains unmoved, unbewegt, rigid, starr. It does not develop into self-knowing spirit, nor does it differentiate itself into different attributes and modes, or determine itself to be thought and extension. Hegel's Spinoza does not, therefore, derive attributes and modes logically from substance, but just assumes that substance has them. That's number one on your handout. I'll, I'll read out the numbers uh, when they're relevant. Furthermore, Spinoza discovers the particular attributes of thought and extension empirically, Hegel's word, and their modes are simply taken up from representation. These modes are then conceived as modes of substance that are nothing actual in themselves, and in this way they are, Hegel says, thrown back into the one absolute substance. They are not shown, however, to re-emerge from substance through its own activity. In the Spinozist system, therefore, Everything is just thrown into the abyss, but nothing comes out of it. Es kommt nichts heraus. Substance thus remains the unmoved unity in which all differences are dissolved. I quote, 
Everything is merely submerged and perishes in a substance which remains motionless within itself and out of which nothing ever resurfaces. Since there is for Hegel, for Hegel's Spinoza, sorry, since there is for Hegel's Spinoza, only substance or God alone, the world has no subsistence, no reality in itself. His system is thus famously, for Hegel, a cosmism. This does not mean simply that there are no finite things, but the latter, as modes of God, merely seem to be things in their own right. The finite, therefore, is, I quote, only phenomenon, seeming, shine. Moreover, finite things do not persist in their illusory subsistence, but constantly disappear into the abyss of substance. Spinoza's substance thus falls short of the concept as Hegel conceives it, for unlike the latter, it does not realize itself in actual independent things in an irreducible sphere of nature. For Hegel, Spinoza, indeed, there is no nature as such, but there only seems to be. Hegel's second criticism of Spinoza is that he bases his philosophy on definitions and axioms that are presupposed and not derived, number two. Their content may be profound and great, as with causa sui, but they are simply assumed to be true and so are unproven. Hegel insists, I quote, that no presuppositions are to be made in logic and that philosophy must therefore begin with sheer indeterminate being. The defect of Spinoza, as Hegel puts it, is however precisely that he presupposes definitions. Hegel's third criticism of Spinoza is that he does not think through the implications of his great insight that determination is negation. In particular, he does not recognize that negation must be conceived as the negation of itself, as absolute negativity, number three. As self-negating, Hegel claims, negation ceases being simply negative and constitutes affirmative being. Indeed, such self-negating negation belongs implicitly to Spinoza's substance, in which all negation and difference is dissolved. For this substance is absolute affirmation, according to Hegel, precisely through negating negation. Spinoza, however, fails to see this and conceives of substance or God without negation as only the positive affirmative. So these are Hegel's main criticisms of Spinoza. But do they hit their target? In certain respects, I think they do. It is true, for example, that Spinoza does not derive the concept of attribute or the attributes of thought and extension from the concept of substance. Number four, why does substance have attributes? Spinoza does not tell us. We could argue that substance has attributes because, to quote Spinoza, each one expresses a certain eternal and infinite essence. But why does substance, or indeed anything, have an essence? And why should the essence of substance or God be expressed in an infinity of attributes? Spinoza does not explain. He also fails to explain why thought and extension are attributes of substance, as we just heard earlier. He takes singular thoughts as given and infers from this that, I quote, there belongs to God an attribute whose concept all singular thoughts involve. But he does not explain how and why substance differentiates itself into thought and extension. The case of modes is more complicated since they could be said to, de be, to be derived from substance insofar as they are effects of the latter's causality, number five. Yet this does not address Hegel's criticism, for Spinoza does not explain why substance exercises causality, why it is the cause of all things or of itself. He does not explain, therefore, why logically substance should have modes or why there should be finite modes or infinitely many of them. Indeed, Spinoza does not explain why being should take the form of substance. His first axiom in the ethics is, whatever is, is either in itself or in another. And this distinction clearly coincides 
with that between substance and modes. Yet this axiom and the distinction it proposes is simply asserted by Spinoza without further justification. It's the first axiom. And so no proof is provided that being must be substance. In his logic, Hegel begins with pure being and then derives the categories of being in itself and being for other, and later, essence and substance. Hegel thus explains why, logically, being must be substance. Spinoza, however, leaves this unexplained. Hegel also charges Spinoza with presupposing his definitions of substance, attribute, and mode. In so doing, Hegel overlooks the fact that Spinoza's definitions are not purely arbitrary, since they have to, I quote Spinoza, explain the inmost essence of the thing, not just some of its properties. Yet Spinoza presupposes the objects to be defined, and thereby also their definitions without proper justification. Hegel is right, therefore, that Spinoza does not derive his definitions or their objects, as he should do, from a starting point that is systematically presuppositionless. Number six. In saying this, Hegel is not seeking to integrate Spinoza into his totalitarian dialectic, as Macheret charges. He criticizes Spinoza for taking for granted what he should prove, and so for being dogmatic. And this criticism, in my view, is correct. It's also true, as Yitzhak Melamed has noted, that Spinoza does not conceive of negation as self-negating and thus as constitutive, constitutive of affirmative being, number seven. Indeed, Spinoza keeps being, in essence, altogether free of negation. Since God is absolutely infinite, he argues, I quote Spinoza, whatever expresses essence and involves no negation pertains to its essence. Similarly, since determination is negation, it does not pertain to the thing in regard to its being. For Hegel, being is shot through with negation. For Spinoza, however, in Hegel's words, being is only being, nothing is only nothing, and neither participates in the other. Spinoza thus remains, in this sense, a disciple of Parmenides. Now, one further Hegelian criticism of Spinoza looks mistaken, but is correct, I think, when interpreted in the right way. Hegel claims that Spinoza's substance is rigid and unmoved, but this is very hard to reconcile with Spinoza's insistence that God's essence is, I quote, the power by which he and all things are and act. Yet what Hegel means by saying that Spinoza's substance is unmoved is that it does not differentiate itself logically into its attributes and modes. And this surely is true, it's number eight. Such substance is indeed the cause of its modes, but it just is this cause and does not determine itself logically to be such. It thus remains eternally what it is, and in this sense is unmoved. So far, so good. Several of Hegel's claims about Spinoza, however, are clearly wrong. Spinoza's substance is not the abyss into which differences are dissolved, but the creative power from which follow infinitely many things in infinitely many modes, as it's kommt doch etwas heraus. Number nine. The different attributes are not merely distinctions that an external understanding makes, but they belong as distinct to substance itself, number 10. Modes, too, do not merely exist in an external understanding, but they are modes of substance that are caused by the latter as well as by other modes, number 11. Nor are finite modes for Spinoza mere shine, and so nothing actual. They are the real effects and expressions of substance. They also exercise their own causality in direct contradiction of Hegel's claim that Spinoza does not proceed from substance to the relation of causality. Pace Hegel, therefore, the world for Spinoza does have subsistence and reality, even though it comprises modes of God. A further aspect of Hegel's critique of Spinoza is more difficult to assess. This is number 12. 
Hegel claims that the universal does not come to be for itself or self-conscious in Spinoza's modes. This, however, looks wrong, since Spinoza argues in the ethics that, I quote Spinoza, God's love of men and the mind's intellectual love of God are one and the same, and that God, the universal in this case, is thus self-conscious in our knowledge and love of him. Yet there remains a subtle difference between Hegel and Spinoza. Hegel writes in his encyclopedia that, I quote Hegel, God is only God insofar as he knows himself, and his self-knowing is further his self-consciousness in human beings. Spinoza's view, however, is somewhat different. His God knows himself in our self-consciousness, and in that sense becomes spirit. But he does not thereby become God. For Spinoza, God is and remains prior to his modes and the cause of the latter. God is, of course, the imminent cause of his modes, so all the latter are in God, and equally he is in them, since all things are and act through his power. Yet God, as God, as creative power, or natura naturans, is the ground of, and in that sense distinct from, the modes of himself in which he is imminent. Spinoza's substance or God is thus subtly different from the absolute as Hegel conceives it. Such substance is the ultimate, imminent cause to which all modes as its effects point back. By contrast, the absolute in Hegel's logic comes to be itself in and through its modes. As Hegel writes in the Phenomenology, the absolute is essentially result, is only what it is at the end, and herein lies its nature, its being actual, subject, or the becoming of itself. In this respect, I think Hegel is right to say that Spinoza's substance is not God or Geist in the full sense. So Hegel is wrong to claim that Spinoza's substance or God is an abyss in which differences are simply dissolved. Yet Hegel's conception of such substance is not wholly consistent, since he also understands it to be the absolutely free cause and thus effective activity, Wirksamkeit, to be power, Macht, that is also act. This inconsistency arises because Hegel understands substance to express two different but related concepts from the logic, the absolute and substance proper. Now, Hegel argues that criticism of a philosophy should be imminent. I quote, you know the passage, true refutation must enter into the power of the opponent and place itself in the circle of his strength. Yet this does not just mean that we must examine philosophical texts closely. It also means that we must provide an imminent account of the concept or concepts informing a philosophy. This concept is presupposed in Hegel's interpretation of that philosophy, but it is derived in a logic that is itself systematically presuppositionless, one that begins from an utterly indeterminate starting point, not from assumed definitions or axioms. The advantage of Hegel's method, if his derivation of categories is indeed imminent, is that he interprets other philosophies through concepts that are properly conceived. The risk, however, is that Hegel attaches the wrong concept to a philosophy, or that he attaches the right concept, but overlooks nuances in that philosophy that do not match the concept. This latter, I think, is what happens in Hegel's interpretation of Spinoza. He's right to see in Spinoza's substance aspects, and I stress aspects, of the absolute and of substance proper. But he largely ignores several features of Spinoza's world that do not fit either concept, such, for example, as the infinite modes, about which Hegel says almost nothing. So let us consider the absolute as Hegel conceives it. Now, this little bit is a bit tricky, uh, I'm afraid, so, but I'll do my best. This absolute, and our, this is the section on, on Wirklichkeit and the last part of the logic of essence for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, this absolute for Hegel is the totality that contains all there is, all forms of being and essence. 
And yet it is absolutely itself, with no internal differences, the absolute a sheer identity. Furthermore, it's both at once. The identity in which all differences are contained, but as dissolved or sublated. Number 13. Now, as sublated, difference is not just absent from, but implicit in the absolute, together with the negativity or reflexion that generates difference. Yet, insofar as reflection is merely implicit and does not permeate the absolute explicitly, its explicit form must fall outside the absolute as external reflection. As external, however, reflection dissolves differences back into the absolute, into its identity, and the absolute thus turns out to absorb once again what its own identity has just set outside it. Note, however, that the absolute to which reflection returns is the explicit negation of reflection and its differences. As, this is number 14. As such, Hegel argues, it is no longer the absolutely absolute in which difference is implicit, but the relative absolute. The absolute as sheer identity without difference and negation. This, Hegel states, is the absolute as attribute, the absolute as it is posited, gazetzed by external reflection. So the attribute is the absolute to which external reflection returns as the negation of reflection and difference. Yet reflection, Hegel insists, is not merely external to, but also implicit in, the initial absolute absolute. It is the inner reflection through which difference is dissolved into identity. As such, it determines the absolute to be identity rather than difference, and so it too turns the absolute into something determinate and one-sided, into an attribute. The absolute is thus given the form of an attribute by external and internal reflection. Note that this attribute is the absolute in a determinate form. It thus has the whole content of the latter, the totality of the absolute, in it. Indeed, this totality as absolute is what sustains the attribute. It is, I quote, the true and, and single subsistence of the attribute. Hegel goes on to argue that since the attribute is determinate, and so is this in contrast to that, it can be accompanied by several other attributes, each of which expresses the totality of the absolute in its own way. Unlike the absolute as such, therefore, the attribute is not intrinsically singular. Yet the attribute is also ambiguous and logically undermines its own determinacy. Now, the absolute into which reflection returns, as we've seen, is the negation of determinacy and difference, is sheer identity. As such, however, the absolute is itself determinate. Identity, in contrast to difference, and so is merely attribute. It's the negation of determinacy, and so it's determinate and so it's attribute. And yet the, deter the attribute is precisely absolute identity and thus the sublation of all determinacy, including its own. This does not now mean that the attribute has no determinacy. It is determinate. It is identity, not difference. In this very identity, however, determinacy is also explicitly negated or, to quote Hegel, it is posited as sublated. To repeat, number 15, the absolute into which reflection returns is indeterminate abstract identity, and so paradoxically, the absolute in the determinacy of identity. It is thus the absolute as attribute rather than true absolute. This attribute, however, is sublated by its own identity. This does not mean it's eliminated but it is reduced by reflection to a merely seeming determinacy, mere shine. When the absolute's determinacy is conceived explicitly as something null, nichtig in itself, it is conceived as a merely fleeting way and manner, art und weise, or a mode of the absolute. 
This mode does not now supplant the attribute, rather the attribute itself takes the form of a mode when it is thought explicitly as mere schein, as the absolute's nichtig, vanishing determinacy. The absolute, therefore, is necessarily determinate through reflection and has an attribute or attributes, but the latter does not exist apart from its modes. Okay, so the attribute is the absolute as determinate, and so is negation. It is identity, not difference. Yet the attribute also takes the form of a mode. As such, Hegel claims it's external to the absolute, since as mere schein, as explicitly negative, it falls outside the absolute's identity. Indeed, the mode is external to the absolute, even insofar as the absolute determines itself through inner reflection to be a mode. In this case, though, the mode is the self-externality, außer sich sein, of the absolute. In the, oh, thank you. in the essential relation which precedes the absolute in the logic, the inner is essence and the outer is being, the sphere of finite things subject to change and destruction. The self-externality of the absolute, therefore, is, I quote, the absolute's loss of itself in the changeability and contingency of being. So in the mode, the absolute takes the form of existing things that come into being and pass away, but that relative to the absolute itself lack subsistence and are mere shine. Okay, now this is the nodal bit, this is that gets a little bit uh, tricky. A mode, Hegel maintains, passes away without turning back into itself, in contrast to the absolute, which retains its self-identity despite the changing of its modes. The mode, however, is doubly negative. It is determinate and so negative. But as mere shine, it is the negative as a mere negative. As such, Hegel argues, the mode doubles back on itself, reinforces its negative character, and thereby relates to itself. And in so doing, it exhibits self-identity after all, the self-identity that is constitutive of the absolute. That's number 16. The mode we recall is a mode of the absolute. It falls outside the absolute's identity, yet it is also the absolute self-externality, the absolute that falls outside itself in the form of the mode. The mode, however, has now been shown to exhibit self-identity. This is not the determinate identity of the attribute, but the identity that consists in relating to oneself, the identity that characterizes the absolute as such. So in the mode, the absolute manifests its own self-identity. This self-identity, however, emerges through the movement of reflection, both inner and outer. It is the self-identity of the absolute that is posited by reflection as, the abs as it determines the absolute to be attribute and then mode. The absolute is identity from the start. It is, however, I quote, first posited, gazetzed, as absolute identity in the mode. Indeed, it is only in the mode that the absolute is truly self-identical, and so truly what it is. The absolute as such is absolute identity. Through external and inner reflection, however, it is determined to be attribute and to have modes, and in that sense becomes external to and divided from itself. As the mode then exhibits self-identity, the self-identity that belongs to the absolute, the absolute overcomes its self-division and becomes again equal to itself. Indeed, it becomes fully self-identical for the first time. Self-identical through the differences that its initial self-identity makes necessary. It is in its modes, therefore, that the absolute is truly self-identical and truly itself, Truly absolute, number 17. More precisely, the absolute is truly self-identical only as the movement of recovering its self-identity in its self-externality, in its modes. It is, I quote, the reflexive movement as which alone the absolute is truly absolute identity. 
The absolute, therefore, proves to be more than just an abyss. It proves to be the logical ground of its attributes and modes, and through them, of its true self. Okay, now Hegel states, I quote, that the concept of the spinozistic sub substance corresponds to the concept of the absolute as it is set out in the logic. And the latter concept clearly explains significant aspects of Hegel's interpretation of Spinoza. Like the initial absolute, substance, the initial absolute, substance for Hegel Spinoza is the abyss in which difference disappears. Like the absolute attribute, at least in part, Spinoza's attribute is substance in a determinate form that exists for external understanding. Unlike the mode of the absolute, Spinoza's modes are beings that in relation to substance have a merely illusory subsistence. These Hegelian claims about Spinoza, however, are mistaken. For Spinoza, the real Spinoza, substance is not an abyss, but creative power that has its own attributes and through them produces real modes of itself with their own causality. Nonetheless, Hegel's concept of the absolute explains to a large degree why he misreads Spinoza as he does. Furthermore, Hegel draws on his account of the absolute to make a legitimate a criticism of Spinoza. Legitimate in my eyes, anyway. For while Hegel derives the attribute and mode logically from the absolute, he charges Spinoza, rightly, with failing to derive them logically from substance. Neither Hegel Spinoza nor the real Spinoza provide such a derivation, number 18. Indeed, Hegel's account of the absolute grounds a further legitimate criticism of both Hegel Spinoza and the real Spinoza. This is that attributes and modes belong to the absolute, not, as both Spinozas think, to substance, number 19. Hegel's demand that Spinoza derive the attributes and modes from substance is thus, in fact, impossible to fulfill. You can't do it. Spinoza certainly must show the logical necessity of attributes and modes, but he can do so only by deriving them from the absolute, not from substance. Moreover, such a derivation, as set out in Hegel's logic, reveals serious inadequacies in the real Spinoza's conception of attributes and modes. This is number 20. It shows that, parche Spinoza, attributes are the product of negativity or reflection, both external and internal, and are distinguished from one another by negation, and so are determinate. It also shows that modes are things that, that relative to the absolute are mere shine, and that logically there can be no infinite modes. They're, if Hegel's derivation is right, they're logically impossible. Yet Hegel's interpretation of Spinoza's substance rests not just on his concept of the absolute, but also on his own concept of substance. Unlike the absolute substance for Hegel is not the abyss in which differences disappear, but the tranquil coming forth of itself in the movement of its accidents. It then proves to be the absolute power within its accidents, that creates and destroys them and converts them from possibility to actuality and vice versa. Now, this conception of substance clearly underlies the idea advanced by Hegel's Spinoza that substance is power and effective activity. Again, however, Hegel's concept of substance provides grounds for an important critique of both his Spinoza and the real Spinoza. This is number 21. Hegel praises Spinoza's conception of substance as causa sui for being genuinely speculative. But substance, as Hegel conceives it, is not itself causa sui. It is, quote, being that is because it is, and so is the unity of being and essence. But parche both Spinoza's, it does not cause itself to exist through its own essence. Indeed, substance for Hegel does not in itself involve causality at all. And when it does lead logically, logically to causality, the latter, causality, takes the form of finite, not absolute causality. Hegel's idea that substance realizes itself in finite causes clearly echoes an idea of, sub, of Spinoza's, the real Spinoza, that Hegel overlooks. Namely, that substance causes finite modes that produce their own effects, 
through being determined to do so by other finite modes. For Hegel, however, substance as such does not exercise any causality, nor does it have modes or attributes. Hegel clearly misunderstands aspects of Spinoza's philosophy. Yet his logical accounts of the absolute and substance ground a critique of Spinoza that applies even when Hegel's errors are corrected. For if Hegel is right about the absolute and substance, and for some, this is a big if, then Spinoza misunderstands substance, attributes, and modes, number 22. Parche Spinoza, the absolute, not substance, has attributes and modes, and substance exercises no causality, at least before it takes the form of finite substances. This critique of Spinoza, in my view, is both important and correct. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Professor Sankaule. Thank you so much. It's open. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, uh, just one, one point. Um, I'm missing in through the whole day <laughs> a notion to come after the absolute in the logic of essence, which means the absolute relation of some substantiality. Das absolute Verhältnis der Substantialität. And this is the point to which Hegel points later on in the Begriffslogik as the starting point for the true ref ref refutation of Spinozism. And we should talk about this notion, I think. It, it's coming after the absolute. Yes, I mentioned that. I mentioned, I, spe I said specifically that substance. Okay. Substance. Okay. Uh, substance. Yeah. Okay. okay. Be because okay. Hegel himself points to this point. This yeah. is the starting point, he says. Yeah. Okay. Die Widerlegung Spinozas Richtig. beginnt Richtig. im Verhältnis der Substantialität. Okay. Yes. Nicht mit der Substanz in der Seinslogik, nicht mit okay. dem Absoluten in der Wesenslogik. Okay. Sorry. Das, first ist, of, first of all, I only das have bedeutet Enthüllung der Substanz im Begriff. Okay, I only have 35 minutes. And für mich, Substanz equals Substantialität. Okay, I'm not distinguishing the two of them. I only have 35 minutes. I wanted to concentrate on the Absolute. I absolutely agree. The point was that there are three sections at the end of the logic of essence, mm -hmm. the absolute, Wirklichkeit, and Substantialitätsverhältnis. That, sec that last part focuses on substance and its accidents, and then the relation of substances as finite causes to one another. My point was that, in fact, Hegel's notion of substance does not match Spinoza's. And this is something we should recognize. So when Hegel in the Begriffslogik looks back and says that we've given an imminent critique of Spinoza in that section, well, strictly speaking, he hasn't. He's given an imminent critique of the aspect of Spinoza that he reads through that category. But for Spinoza, substance is the cause of itself, and it produces modes that themselves exercise their own causality. But Hegel's substance which is in relation to accidentalität, so it is also relational, is not causal. It's not causal. And in fact, you're going to talk about this tomorrow, das Sein in allem Dasein. Mm -hmm. What substance is, is das Sein in allem Sein. It's not the cause of itself. Now, it leads on to causality, but of course, when substance takes the form of causality, it takes the form of finite causes in relation to other finite causes that ultimately end up in reciprocal causality, and that geht über in, in den Begriff. So I appreciate what you say, but I guess what I'm trying to do is be faithful to Hegel and be faithful to Spinoza. And I don't think we should, so, so we should, we should think that Hegel's account of the Substantialitätsverhältnis actually is an account of, of Spinoza's substance. That's, that's my point. point. 
Well, okay. Okay. Right, okay. But, Klaus, let's just... What Hegel's trying to do, and I think he's trying to do it honestly, is he's not constructing something. His view is, as you know, and I think has been pointed out earlier, that the history of philosophy largely uh, sort of mirrors, but not in all its contingencies, obviously, uh, the development of concepts in the logic. And so Hegel is looking to various concepts in the logic to understand various historical figures. And the concepts he thinks are appropriate for Spinoza are the absolute and substance, or substantiality. And it seems to me, I did emphasize that I think he's right as regards certain aspects of Spinoza. But I don't think what Hegel comes up with matches Spinoza in every respect. So in that way, we've got to say that Hegel doesn't deliver the kind of imminent reading that we might want to give if we were teaching Spinoza, you know, as I have done regularly for many years. Um, uh, but I don't think it's just a construct either. I don't think Hegel's being arbitrary. I think he's discerning what he thinks is the begriff that's underlying Spinoza. And as I say, in certain aspects, I think he's right. In other aspects, I think he's wrong. So. I would want to, um, anyway, I'm just repeating myself. I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but I wouldn't want to say it's just a construction. I think that's a little bit, uh, a bit too arbitrary. Gregor? Um, thank you, this was quite wonderful. And it's absolutely great to see people fired up about metaphysics. So thank you very much oh, for yes, this. Yes. In our family, every day, around the dinner table, <laughs> you know, the kids, come on, Dad, let's have a fight about <laughs> metaphysics. It's really good. Um, so two comments, um, playing the devil's advocate. Uh, first, the, 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 que the whole question of derivation and, you know, why, does, why doesn't Spinoza show us how does he come from substance to, to, to attributes and so on? Uh, we've been discussing this with Klaus in the in the in the coffee break. Uh, the question of Anfang, which I think we should recognize is a historically contingent German problem. It was a very specific problem of uh, well, Klaus might disagree when I say <laughs> that it's historically contingent. You might disagree, but I think it's very logical that this question of Anfang and things having to you know reason having to find its own um, Anfang in itself without you know. Uh, any kind of help of religion or faith. I think this is a very specific um, historical contingency. And then, you know, why would we, n you know, we just as much as you say that uh, Spinoza's, Spinoza also just uses contingent terms, uh, typical for his historical uh, period. Uh, you, ca you cannot, you know, think beyond that. It's the, the, the questions and topics that he uses. And so I think it's, there is no reason for Spinoza to have a question of Anfang in the way that Hegel and other German idealists have. So that's one, sir. Okay, but Yitzhak will add. Uh, but I have uh, another comment which is very quick, um, which I, I, I suppose it's a clarification, clarification comment question. Ah, between seven and nine, uh, your claims. I'm very grateful that you did this, uh, so that we have uh, we don't have to take oh. notes because you've taken them for it us. It would have been impossible to follow without it. <laughs> I know. Yes, I appreciate that. So my question in regard to seven and nine, the reason is that you say nine comes what Hegel go gets wrong, but seven is what uh, Hegel uh, gets right uh, when criticizing Spinoza. But yes. the thing is. Um, the way I see it, Spino uh, uh, Hegel's claim that. Uh, that Spinoza's substance is basically an abyss is precisely his uh, claim that, is the same as his claim that Spinoza has only negation. Uh, because th the way Spinoza argues, uh, uh, sorry, the way Hegel argues that Spinoza's system is just an abyss where everything vanishes is just a version of him saying that all determination is negation. And yes, well, that's, that's just that. Spinoza's story ends there. And it doesn't matter how much Spinoza argues about thousand roses mm -hmm. and everything is productive and everything is alive. It doesn't matter for Hegel because in the end it's just, you know, one-sided negation. There's no second negation. There's no negation of negation. So I would argue that okay. seven and nine are the same thing and therefore you cannot say that, you know, it's okay. uh, right or wrong. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot in there. We've got a good five hours to go. We, we don't have to go anywhere. No, that's great. Good. That's good to do.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on, on the question of derivation, I think, um, I'm gonna, I think it is related to the question of beginnings, you're right. But I think one can also see the question of derivation in much more traditional terms. It's questions of justification, of necessity, of you know, why should we believe such and such. Um, now, Hegel has a very strict sense of what it takes in order to provide such a derivation. And on my reading, at least, and a number of others, that requires stripping everything back to a very minimal beginning, taking as little for granted as possible, thinking in a systematically presuppositionless way. And of course, then this raises the question of the Anfang. But I think you know, there are, there are uh, people who are not Hegelians can worry about whether Spinoza's uh, um, definitions are, are legitimate and justified. Um, yet, I absolutely do not agree, I'm sorry, that, uh, that the question of the Anfang is a historically conditioned German problem. I mean, Descartes, to my knowledge, wasn't that German. And indeed, Spinoza, it seems to me, is concerned with beginnings. I mean, I did, I slipped it in, but Spinoza's definitions are not arbitrary. Then, of course, he's historically conditioned in some way. I mean, the very fact that he talks about substance, attribute, and modes, but he's trying to find definitions which generate the object, not which give you properties of them. And so when he does think about what are appropriate definitions. So I would put Spinoza on the side of the angels there. He, he, he is thinking about beginnings. Um, and, um, but having said that, I, I think you're right that thinking about derivation means thinking about uh, beginnings. And I guess, I mean, no, this is gonna, it sounds irritating to everybody who doesn't, uh, uh, interpret Hegel along the way that I do, really, uh, is that my view is there is no alternative if we're going to answer the question of derivation than to start in the way Hegel does in the logic. I've taught, I'm sure as we all have, a lot of different philosophers, and it seems to me all of them in some way have some question-begging aspect. And, and, and I, so I would say that, 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 that the question of derivation is important, and, and Spinoza does fall short uh, from Hegel's point of view in that respect. But I think he is concerned with the Anfang. I think that's not fair. Uh, what was the other point? Now, that's really interesting. Okay, I think you're right in Hegel's mind. I think in Hegel's mind, if I, can, I can't see properly here, um, that, uh, in fact, this point is made exactly by Hegel, if I'm right, in the remark to Dasein, is that the one? Um, where he says that, that the idea that determination is negation leads us to the notion of of, of a substance as an absolute Einheit. And some people scratch their head and think, how do you get there? Well, you get there very easily. If determination is negation and substance is pure affirmation, it, ergo has no negation, ergo it has no internal determination, ergo it's an absolute Einheit. And then it's not far from that to the idea of an abyss. Absolutely, I think you're right. But what I was saying here, if you, if you notice, seven is under what Hegel gets right about the real Spinoza. Eight or oh, nine is under about what Hegel gets wrong about the real Spinoza. <laughs> My point was that although logically the argument that you're tracing there, yes, I can understand Hegel's argument, but I'm afraid the brute fact of, of, of Spinoza's text suggests that substance is not an abyss. Um, and of course, there's the other side of, of Spinoza that Hegel acknowledges <coughs> Uh, when he thinks that also Spinoza's substance is causa sui and is the power, the macht, to act. Um, so there's even an inconsistency there. So that's how I would separate them out. That, again, if you like, Spinoza is not fitting neatly into the logic that Hegel's tracing. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. There's no point in doing Hegel and Hegel Spinoza. We need to do Hegel and Hegel Spinoza and the real Spinoza, or the real Spinozas. Um, <laughs> Well, okay, Klaus, uh, okay, Klaus, just calm down, okay? I'm looking at one at this very minute as someone whose work I greatly respect. Uh, there are a lot of people. I would read Henry Allison. I would read Macheret. I would read Bennett. I would read lots of people. And I would read Yitzhak probably above all. Um, I'm not a Spinoza expert, expert, but I have been teaching Spinoza for well over 10 years every other year. So I like to think I put a bit of effort into trying to get Spinoza right. So when I, mean, when I talk about the real Spinoza, I'm not being naive. I know there are different interpretations. Bennett, you know, you don't agree with Curley, and I, I know there are differences. But we know that there's another Spinoza out there who isn't captured by Hegel Spinoza. Uh, again, Klaus, we've only got 35 minutes, OK? We can only say what we can say. There are other qualifications that obviously I, I should have given, but. Uh, 
I, I'm, that's what I mean by the real Spinozas. Or I'll pluralize, if you like, the real Spinozas. Uh, let's have that. Yeah, there was this order for Well, I, I suppose I, well, w we should speak about uh, uh, to the, um, uh, all those French interpreters also about the real Hegel and, uh, and uh, Hegel in these uh, uh, versions. Well, but, but that was not my point. I think, well, what Hegel is doing is uh, thinking how Spinoza should have thought. So his, this, this, uh, yeah. w this is very important, I think, your point of um, separating between uh, absolute and uh, substance in, the, in Hegel, in the science of logic, that's really uh, an important in, uh, point for interpretation. Uh, as I take, I don't know if you agree, as I take it, in the, in the absolute and mode, he's saying what sh how Spinoza should have thought well, he should have thought like, like that if he, he were uh, coherent. Well, then, then when he speaks about substance, uh, that's, that's al al already no more uh, how Spinoza should have thought, but well, in some way, how, sp how Spinoza uh, thought about su substance as um, um, uh, um, uh, necessity. Well, uh, anyway, uh, my question, uh, then I would say, uh, perhaps we should construct uh, this uh, difference uh, between substance and absolute, uh, taking into account this, uh, this Hegel's intentions not to interpret the, the real Spinoza, but to say how Spinoza should have thought, if he were uh, consequent. Well, uh, any, a, anyway, when you say that substance exercises no causality, uh, I would think it. Um, uh, Hegel says that substance uh, dialectically transforms itself into category, yes, uh, that's into right. cal cal causality. Yeah. Then, in that sense, also Spinoza should have thought like like that, so that he could understand how sub substance ex exerts uh, causality. Well, and then of course we we go to reconstruct freedom through uh, reciprocal action. You you did a very uh, short reference to um, to modality, and I should ask should ask why is modality between uh, the absolute and the substance? That would be also another mm -hmm, question mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. me. Thank, thank you. Good. Well, yes. any, Anyway, in any way I agree with, with everything. I should uh, perhaps only construct uh, in a different way. Yeah, good. Thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, uh, and I think that uh, I, I would, yes, but I'd want to qualify it ever so slightly. I mean, I do think that the, um, okay, how to explain this? Um, let me just backtrack. Um, the distinction I try, I try to use when, when actually teaching Spinoza, but also teaching Hegel, um, is to draw a threefold distinction rather than the usual twofold distinction between, um, if you like, the normative and the descriptive, the sort of the ought and the is. It seems to me if we're brought up in a Kantian environment, we've pretty much only got a twofold distinction. You've got the understanding of what is, you know, theoretical knowledge, and you've got the understanding of what ought to be, uh, practical and sort of normative knowledge. But I think Hegel, Spinoza, Plato have a third idea, which is the true nature of such and such. So when Hegel's talking about the state, for example, he's not obviously describing 19th century states. I mean, he's pulling things from lots of different states and the corporations had been abolished by that time. So there's no state that looks like that. But he's not just giving us an ought either. He's giving us the true idea of the state, what the state in truth is, just like Plato is trying to articulate what justice is. Now, I think, in that sense, Hegel's logic is normative. It's telling us what being is, must logically be thought to be in all its categories. And so by the time we get to the absolute and substance, yes, there's a normative dimension to this. What the absolute is, what substance is, what begriff is, how it must be thought. And clearly, for those philosophers who don't think like that, then Hegel's account becomes 
much more normative. Indeed, it does for all of us. I mean, he's not just directing this at Spinoza, but I think Hegel's idea is to try and reinigen, clarify the Kant's concepts with which we all or ordinarily uh, operate. He's trying to get us to understand properly what it is to be something, what is quantity, and so on. So there's absolutely a normative dimension to that. Um, and so I agree with that. I think he is saying, Spinoza, this is how you should have thought attributes and modes as belonging to the absolute. This is how you should have thought substance. But I think there's more than that. I think the reason he's focusing on Spinoza in particular is that Spinoza does in part get it. That's the thing, more than other philosophers. And, and I think that's what's significant. And, and I think that's, how, that's what matters to me. Not does Hegel get it right about every aspect of Spinoza. Well, no, he, of course, he doesn't. But is Spinoza the philosopher who gets it <laughs> about the absolute and substance more than anybody else? And I would say, yes, I think, I think that's right. I think, so I think it's, it's legitimate for Hegel to associate these categories with Spinoza rather than, say, Malbranche or, or, or somebody else. Um, so I'd say, yes, how Spinoza should have thought, but also did, in fact, think to a degree. Um, there's a parallel, sorry, I know we're probably running out of time, but, but an exact parallel in, um, in, you might think this is a leap, but in Hegel's so-called critique of Kant in the philosophy of right. You know, Hegel derives the notion of morality, we get morality, we get abstract duty. And a lot of Kantians have pointed out, say that Kant's moral philosophy is not that abstract. But Alan Wood came out with a very good idea. What Hegel's doing is showing what Kant is entitled to. And to the extent that Kant has a richer concept of morality, he's not, strictly speaking, entitled to it. Now, I think that's right. I think that's right. And I'm sort of... There's, again, there's a normative dimension to it. So, so thank you. It's a helpful question, and that's how I would respond. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for this uh, marvelous uh, endowed that could be the object of a seminar of a week or something like that. Uh, my question is similar to the question of uh, Gregor but it is on a precise point. Uh, you say uh, point six, uh, what Hegel gets right. Spinoza does not derive his definition on, uh, or their objects from a starting point that is systematically presuppo presuppositionless. <laughs> Sorry for the difficulty. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, Spinoza has a presupposi presupposition. Spinoza is a mode and uh, of the sus substance, so is in relation with the world. And for example, uh, uh, in the appendix of part one of the ethics, uh, uh, Spinoza says it's I it, is it would be impossible to break with uh, the um, um, teleological or uh, uh, finalistic bias if it does not, uh, if has not existed Euclid or geometry. So the presupposition for philosophy is science. And the direct presupposition for, uh, the of, of uh, Spinozian thought is Car Cartesian, the, the carte, uh, the, the Cartesian thought. So substance, attributes, and modes are uh, terms fundamental for the carte. And uh, uh, what uh, I think uh, from uh, uh, what point of view we must uh, judge uh, Spinoza. Uh, not uh, from the derivation, I, I, it's a German problem, in the I, idealistic problem. No, no, of course, I, I don't want to, to say something racist. Or <laughs> it's a, it's a, of course, no, it's a, it's a, but it's a problem of uh, the, the, the idealism. And the, the other problem is the problem of deduction. For example, the critics that uh, is made by Fichte, by Schelling, and by Hegel is uh, there is not a deduction of the finite from the infinite. So, uh, if we judge Spinoza uh, with these lenses, uh, I, th I think we, we lost the operation made by Spinoza. That is, to, to, to m produce some effects, theoretical effects, on the field of Descartes. 
So when he poses uh, one substance, he is changing uh, the, the, the sense of substance in Descartes. In, the, in Descartes, uh, the, the term substance is equivocal. So you have only one substance, and uh, uh, when he says uh, uh, God, uh, sorry, I, I, I've written that in English because it's difficult for me to, to, to translate from Italian, but uh, God uh, is a cause of itself in the same sense, mm -hmm. Deleuze has uh, a, lo a lot insisted on that, the same sense of, uh, in which it is cause of all other things. So is he is changing. Uh, uh, in this sense, I, I think we must uh, um, uh, think the method of Spinoza not as a geometrical method that has uh, uh, some uh, 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 evidence at the beginning but as a, a sort of political method, a, a kind of machine that is, I, I don't know if machine is the right term, uh, to, to, to transform uh, the imaginary. Sorry to interrupt, can, can, can I just answer the original, can I just answer the, the, your, your original point? Because, um, okay, let me throw a question back to you. When you're, when you're listening to a political debate, do you ever sometimes say to yourself, oh, well, I mean, he's just taking that for granted. I mean, he's not proving that. He's just asserting that. Well, I think we do. I think we all do at times. You know, we acknowledge that, that certain kind of discourses have certain presuppositions, but we also object uh, when we think that they shouldn't have. Now, it seems to me that the demand for derivation is the demand for a certain justification, for necessity a demand not just to take for granted the point you're, you're making. And I don't think that's just a historically conditioned German problem. I think that's a problem rooted in the nature of argument and, and what it is to try and understand and justify what we do. And I think, as I say, I think Hegel and Spinoza, I think Spinoza is on the side of the angels in that case, because I think hey, Spinoza's worried and does think about how to begin. Um, I think Descartes thinks about how to begin. I'm not sure Leibniz does. At least when I teach Leibniz, it's not clear where I start. I don't know about Plato either, but, but they, they're doing different things. Um, and I, so I, that's my main worry. I think, I think there may well be historical circumstances that explain why the question of, der the question of justification uh, receives the kind of prominence and the answer it receives. And I think there is in the case of Hegel, and the obvious context is that of, of freedom broadly, broadly understood. I mean, Hegel himself set, situates his own philosophy in the context of philosophical freedom, you know, Fichte, Kant, Rousseau, political freedom, the French Revolution, religious freedom, the, the, the Reformation. And one, another way of thinking about um, suspending assumptions and not taking things for granted is not to take things on authority. Now, he, rightly or wrongly, Hegel thinks that Catholicism takes things on authority. Protestantism is meant to free us from authority. Whether he's right about that is not my concern, but he associates Lutheranism with a, a move within religion to liberate us from simple authority. And I think if you think of it in that way, would you really want to have a way of arguing that just based itself on authority. You say, okay, well, I'll argue this, 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 and okay, then, then you just gotta believe me, because that's it, I'm saying it. No, we wouldn't. We'd say, come on, that's wrong. Justify your position. Now, I think Hegel takes that back to a very minimal position. Now, when you think about it, Spinoza gets pretty close. Hegel begins with pure being. Spinoza begins with being plus intelligibility in terms of causality. So Spinoza's substance is just being understood, sorry, as the cause of itself, as intelligible. And you could say Hegel's being is intelligible, Spinoza's being in, is intelligible. Hegel's just isn't intelligible through causality, where Spinoza's is. They're very close. There's not far for Spinoza to go, if you like, to get to where Hegel is. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about that, that yes, of course you're right. The vocabulary of, of modes and, and, and substance has a history there. But I think the, uh, the reason I went through, I put you through the agony of going through the absolute is to show that Hegel thinks 
there is a logical reason why we would still think in terms of attributes and modes, even though we're not immediately indebted to the medieval period. Even now, in modernity, attributes and modes have a legitimacy in conjunction with a certain concept, the absolute, if and when we ever use that. Um, so, uh, one last point, and forgive me if this is obvious, but I find sometimes it's not obvious to people. When I say that Hegel's thought is systematically pre presuppositionless, I just mean it's systematically presuppositionless. Of course, it has a whole host of presuppositions. Language, history, religion, the fact that Hegel's alive, the fact that we have earlobes, there's all those things that are presuppositions of doing philosophy. The issue is, are there any principles at the beginning, definitions or axioms, that govern how we are to think? And I think Hegel thinks, no, there aren't, which is why we begin with pure being. So I'm assuming that's clear, but just in case it isn't, Uh, I don't think so, no, because uh, the reason, um, well, in one sense, um, in one sense, logic, logic obviously inhabits the element of thought, not of imagination or feeling. Um, but I think the reason, if you like, Hegel privileges thought is that of all the, the femurgen of the mind, of all the capacities of the mind, uh, thought has the ability to abstract and to set, it side, uh, set aside assumptions uh, in the way that feelings and um, sensations don't. I, I guess Hegel has some wonderful stuff on feeling, particularly, I think, in the, in, in the unhappy consciousness. You know, the self that reaches out to the other but then only ever gets itself because all it does, it reaches out in feeling. And so, you know, it don't, feeling always comes back to yourself, um, whereas thought has this capacity to abstract. So I think that's why, that's what I would say. Feeling doesn't have the capacity to set itself aside, whereas thought does. <laughs> right, uh, well, I suppose... Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. actually very sorry, but I think uh, we had to leave the building and <laughs> we can keep talking about substance and it's more over dinner, over something. And, but thank you. Thank you.